Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Okay, I'll call the August 7th, 2023 session of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners to order. And uh, I have the honors this morning, so if you will join me in prayer. Father God, as we join together to do the business of the citizens of Alamance County, we seek your, your guidance, your wisdom, your courage to do the right thing, dear Lord, for our people. And we ask you to to be with us, to keep us safe, to keep our county safe, and and uh, help it weather all the storms that come before us, dear Father. We ask you to bless these deliberations and uh, help us to uh, always do the right thing, dear Lord. And we ask this, dear Lord, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Follow me with a pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America. America. And, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> okay, you all have the agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. A second. Motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Approved. Public comments. Uh, we only have one. Mr. Morcom. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity. And um, I'm being told that nobody can understand my accent, so I've provided some paper. I've never have had a problem with that. <laughs> um, my name is Peter Morecambe, and I'm concerned about matters that were reported in the Alamance News on August the 3rd. Uh, here's the headline. County's rank for teacher supplement drops from 13 to 22 prior to recent hike. And the Elements News published a table showing the top 25 school districts ranked by teacher supplement, and we were one of them. Sandy Ellington Graves is quoted as saying, we are below the state average. I think it's important for people to understand we've lost some of our competitiveness. While the ABSS may rank 22 in teacher supplements, it's still in the top quartile of all the school districts in North Carolina. So it's wrong to say, uh, it's below average, that, that's a little misleading. Um, somehow the cart got in front of the horse. Uh, in, in the private sector, pay increases are usually linked to performance in some way. But we never talk about performance, do we? We're always talking about more money. Let's just see what the performance is. Um, will our schools improve? That would be nice to have somebody come here and tell us our schools are going to improve. Um, the ABS is near the bottom of the third quartile. That's pretty low when it comes to most measures of performance. Will raising teacher supplements change that? Um, our overall rank amongst school districts is 225 out of 321. Now, you didn't know there were 321 school districts. You thought there were only 120, and that is, that is true. There are 120 traditional, or maybe 119 traditional school districts. But they now count charter schools as, each charter school counts as a school district, so there's another 200 school districts, which are all charter schools. Now, we've got four of those charter schools in this county, and they all perform well above the Alamance Burlington schools. Then I've got three charts on that. How did we get to be so low? Well, you've got to perform badly on the various tests. Only 40% of our students are proficient in mathematics and only 40% in reading. That's a pretty shameful statistic. Graduation rates for ABSS average a miserable 84%. For contrast, our charter schools are 95 plus. Um, enrollment. The ABSS has fewer students than it had in 2017, yet the capital spending continues. Over the last seven years, 
279 million has been spent on capital projects while enrollment has declined. That seems pretty crazy. At the same time, private schools, charter schools, and home schools have grown without requiring any capital from the county. Maybe I better shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Thank you. <coughs> Okay. Consent agenda. Do we have a motion? Uh, so moved. Second. I'm sorry. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Approved unanimously. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Isley? We have a public hearing. Okay. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, Marlena Isley, GIS Director for the County. And we're here to request Board of Commissioner approval to adhere to our addressing ordinance, which has been in existence since 2011, and to address public safety issues and set road, road naming standards and addressing. These addressing ordinance are a common thing um, for local government across the state and many other states um, to name. Excuse me a moment. Yes. Do we need, this is a public hearing, so we need to please do technically please enter that. into a public in here. I'm okay. sorry. That's fine. I will look at that. Um, okay, do we have a motion to go into a public hearing? So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, we're in now in a public hearing. Okay. Commissioner Thompson, can you tell me what that picture is that's on screen? And can you spell it, please? What the picture is? Mm -hmm. It's like a playground with a bunch of kids playing. Can I spell it? Yeah. I-T-L-O-O-K-S-L, no. <laughs> well, if it's a park, can you spell park for me? Yeah, P-A-R-K. P-A-R-K. Oh, not sure. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, can you say this word for me? Okay, first of all, why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> you know something. I'm, okay, what? Go do again. What? P A R C. Can you say that word for me? Park. Okay. So, park with the C and park with the K sound the same. Mm -hmm. Park with the C is French for park. Um, and this is what brings us here today for this public hearing. Our addressing ordinance has been in existence since 2011, and what we're here for is the non-conventional spelling of park that is phon phonetically similar to P-A-R-K, and this spelling will cause an issue. Um, this project happens to take place in Elon, and Elon signed this um, addressing ordinance in 2016, so they've been with us for a little while doing their addressing. The history behind this ordinance is it took several years to approve and the Board of Commissioners worked together with GIS, emergency services, and several of the municipalities in order to bring about this, um, this ordinance to increase public safety and reduce human error in 911 dispatch. So this has helped us to get municipalities on board in preparation for Next Gen 911. Next Gen 911 is basically where all calls statewide are routed through um, GIS data. And that data is compiled through a company called Geocom. And there's several other components in it, but they compile all this GIS data for the entire state. In 2011, we only had about 11,000 streets across the county. And today we've got about 14,000 and climbing. These dot, dot data sets are very dynamic and they change on a daily basis. And we work very diligently to maintain a 98% accuracy and keep that moving forward. We've already met with um, CECOM, Elon Fire and Law, and the developers in, in uh, March of this year to try to go ahead and come about a resolution with this street name. They have requested several streets um, with park in them um, at first, but we've talked it down to one, and they still want to use Village Park with a C instead of Village Park with a K, the traditional spelling. And we advertise the public hearing um, July 20th. So our biggest issue with this is that resi residents and visitors will have to spell this street name every single time they call 911. And it will cause delays. 
And anytime they use that address for anything, so whether they are ordering a package, Amazon, requesting a service, or even a simple pizza, or trying to enroll their kids in school, they're going to have to spell the street name every single time. Um, so anything related to that address. That orange arrow that you actually see on screen is the main street entering into the subdivision. That is what they want to call Village Park. And this is also the main entrance into the subdivision. There will be three commercial buildings and eight multifamily homes addressed off of this if this is allowed. So this development could have as many as 1,200 to 1,500 potential future residents or visitors on a regular consistent basis that may need to call 911 at any given time. So they don't have to necessarily live there. Um, they could just be visiting or just in the area nearby. Parcel 179039 is our current focus that we're focused on. It's highlighted on screen. But there's future development across University Drive and across Shallowford, where there's also um, the developers own those same tracts of land. These two other pending developments, if we break or deviate the ordinance this time, could set precedence for them to come back and be allowed for different spellings on other common words or things that are phonetically similar, same deal across the street. The developer is concerned about branding and the subdivision, the actual sign entering for to denote where the subdivision is can have any name they choose. Um, but we need the internal street names to adhere to the actual ordinance that's in place. The Greenhawk Corporation is a developer. They'll be here for a few years to complete this project, but they will not live there daily for decades to come. And we all know McIntosh at the late the subdivision, but can you honestly tell me you know one street name in that subdivision unless you live there? Future homeowners don't purchase a home because of the street name. They purchase a home because it fits some need or location for their family, or it has enough bedrooms, or it looks pretty, or their price range, or something like that. That's what they're concerned about. GIS is concerned about the public safety and getting the quickest response time possible. And just because local fire and police might know where this place is, we have to be able to get that call to them first. And I wanted to explain how 911, the actual caller, is a live person. Geocom is the state's GIS data vendor, so we upload data to them every single week. AT&T handles the call routing. CECOM is our local PSAT. They get the calls that come in once it's been delivered from AT&T. The telecommunicator is another live person, and that person has to answer and validate the location of the call and then the emergency. Then we get to the first responder and getting the call out to them to get the help to the caller. So many things can delay 911 call um, response time, and we don't need the street name spelling to be one of them. GIS delivers all this data to Geocom every single week, and we are required to maintain that 98% accuracy. But eventually, this next gen 911 process will move just from the state of North Carolina to the entire country and moving forward. And for the state of North Carolina, there's already over 5.5 million address points and almost 900,000 streets across the state that they're routing these calls through. And we must keep this data very accurate. Most callers believe that 911 can find them just like Google Maps. They think it's a dot on the map and it's that simple, but it's not. There's a lot of components in play. And difficulties validating that location, even if it's just one letter, can easily add 60 seconds to that call because you're dealing with a live person that's under stress and adrenaline and having to ask them questions that they may not be fully cognizant of what they're trying to com communicate at the time other than I need help. So what does the telecommunicator see when they're on screen? Um, the telecommunicator sees these lists. So if they were, it was Park Village Drive, they would literally see 17 other streets containing park in the CAD system, and they have to go ahead and try to pick the correct one and get the one correct that the caller is actually calling from. So the developers reconsider to Village Park with a C. And there are still four village containing streets in the CAD data set. So they're still going to need to spell it, even if it's the second word. Um, and this non-conventional spelling still goes against the ordinance, and it still sounds just like park with a K. The approved street name list is actually needed before Elon Planning can move forward with their TRC approval. So these things have not been recorded yet. And one of the other issues the developer brought up was that we did this twice 
in Wayne County. And so they insisted that they used it there twice, and we went ahead and we figured we'd do our due diligence and do our homework, so we contacted Wake County, and we did confirm that they did request Park Line with a C, Drive, and it was on, they used a street name reservation application, which is what you see on screen. And we also have the recorded plats and some screenshots from their GIS website, and we also checked Google, and it, they use standard street names every single time on there. So they use street names like Quiet Sky Place, Eliza Lane, Le Blue Court, Longberry Place, Milltown Ridge Run, and Edward Green. Those are standard street names. Nowhere in there is a park, anything. Um, we've also given them 21 other possible streets, and we've given them a list to choose from to fit with their French theme if that's what they choose to continue with. Um, but Wake County did not allow this, and they struck a line through it and said, we're not going to allow this. You need to pick standard street names because they have an addressing ordinance very similar to ours. So we would like to adhere to ours. So basically what it boils down to is the developer is in violation of um, two parts of our addressing ordinance, the non-traditional spelling, because, and then also because it sounds just like park with a K. This was not allowed in Wake County, um, who also has an addressing ordinance, and we would like for it not to be um, done here. We don't want to have to create an issue that doesn't need to be when we already have an addressing ordinance for that place. It's our job as public servants to do what's best for our current citizens and any future citizens or visitors that are going to live, work, or play on this subdivision. This ordinance was designed in 2011 because there were issues and problems that needed to be addressed. And we work to create that addressing ordinance to adjust and basically make those problems get fixed as best we could and not continually um, allow them to continue to make the data set worse, um, and especially in preparation for next gen. So we want to improve, uh, improve public safety. And so we're asking the Board of Commissioners support to enforce this ordinance. And it's all about public safety and response time. We are public servants and we're here to ensure public safety and that's all we're trying to do is to maintain that. And adhering to this ordinance um, and providing quality GIS data with 98% accuracy every single week allows us to do so. Are there any questions? Any questions? No, she's asked me enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm about some French here in a minute. <laughs> okay, well, I will let Chad come up and Chad can give it. Thank you, though. Thank you. Mr. Turner? I'll defer for the moment. Thank you. Mr. Paisley, any questions? I do not have questions. I think we ought to stick with the ordinance. Okay, I don't have any questions either. Okay, and I think uh, we have some representatives here from, uh, I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. It's okay. Good morning, my name's Chad Huffine. I'm the civil engineer for the project. We're at 505 East Davis Street in Burlington. I have here with me this morning, Jeremy Medlin with Green Hawk, Blaine Jackson with Green Hawk, and Tony Tate with uh, Tony Tate Landscape Architecture. Uh, we'd like to present to you this morning a little bit about the project and then speak with you about the ordinance uh, specific to the items uh, Ms. Isley has brought to your attention and our take on those as well. So if you'll bear with us and give us a few minutes, we'll uh, enlighten you on the project that we're excited about in Elon. Green Hawk and what we, who we are and what we do. We're based in Raleigh, North Carolina. We actively work in seven, seven counties here in North Carolina. We, uh, we're developers, predominantly residential, but we also do office and flex. We have about 6,000 units uh, that we control, mostly own, owned. And then we also have um, you know, a, a business park and warehouses and numerous other things. We also develop and participate in apartments. So Park Northwest is, uh, 
it's its own identity in Elon, North Carolina, and uh, we are actively under development. We're not speculators. We own it. We're under development right now. Uh, that development will be 184 residential units, 200 apartments, and 54,000 square feet of space. Can you say that again? It's uh, 184 residential units, 200 apartments, and 54,000 square feet of space. The development started um, about 40, 30, 45 days ago, and we plan on having residences um, occupying the site next year. Um, what it means to you and why we're here is when you factor in the value of the land, the value of the infrastructure, all the sticks and bricks, you're talking about $150 million. I mean, it's a big investment that we're, and a big commitment that we're making here in your county. And just like Coke and Ford and, you know, other big, big outfits, we're trying to create a brand and, um, and we're very aware of our marketing and our branding. And so that's why we're here today to try to um, um, convince you that this is a this is a reasonable idea. And the other municipalities that we, we work in, um, a lot of the mainstream names have been taken and spoken for, and you're forced to to do unique and ab somewhat abnormal things. But in this in this instance, park. Uh, is relevant to this community because we have an acre and a half park in the middle of it all and, and that's attached in the collateral that I just shared with you. So as you're coming up our main entry, the centerpiece of the site is a park and um, yes it is French. I'm not French, I'm Irish by ancestry <laughs> so um, I know that's Again, we're just trying to create a unique destination in your county. And uh, it's, a, it's going to be a special place whether you approve this or not. We're committed. We're underway. We're excited about it. We hope you, you folks are. Um, but if you, go, if you look at other municipalities, you're forced to do Latin names and all kinds of crazy stuff. We're not trying to do that here. Um, and I can, I can appreciate her position and, and uh, the hard work she's done on this. Um, but that's why we're here. And I hopefully, hopefully, I don't want you to feel like we're wasting your time and bringing something in front of you that's got no merit. I mean, it's a big investment. It's a big commitment. And that's why we're here today. I'm going to pass, pass it over to Chad. All right, it's Chad Huffine again. Um, Mr. Carter, if I could bring you some information to follow along with me. So not to um, belabor what Ms. Isley brought to your attention, we, we are seeking an alternative spelling. Uh, in, in accordance with the county ordinance, and fortunately for us, the commissioners in 2011, when this ordinance was adopted, provided a provision to come before you and ask specifically for uh, names that staff could not approve. According to the ordinance, according to the letter of the ordinance, Staff has no choice but deny this and ask us to uh, choose other names. Because of the importance, the location, the size of the project, the future branding, the, the main stake in Elon and Alamance County that Greenhawk is bringing, uh, it is very important to us to have Village Park as the main access to the property. Uh, so fortunately, we're able to bring that to you and let you de uh, deliberate and, and determine whether our uh, argument has merit and uh, if this uh, street name is workable. So if you'll follow along with me, we provided for you a letter dated March 23rd uh, that began the process for our request of the uh, street name Village Park. If you'll go to the next page or maybe on top of yours depending on how it was assembled, you have an Alamance County Commissioner summary. Uh, 
bold letters at the top. Mr. Lashley has it located if you uh, you all have it in front of you. So consideration with the street name park, P-A-R-C, we believe is vital to the creation of the destination and the development known as Park North currently underway. We broke ground in July. Park East is currently zoned in the town of Elon. Uh, that, that occurred in June last month. Uh, this property is located in Boone Station. We're asking that the word park be used in the Village Park access. Staff recommendation Alamance County is adherence to the ordinance. The ordinance provides for the opportunity to appeal and request the street name, so that's why we're before you. The signing county commissioners and authors of this ordinance upon its adoption had the foresight to incorporate into the ordinance by codification as item A, the very first item, the public hearing to allow for the process for an appeal at a staff level denial. The specific appeal is for a very unique case in a street naming, and we reference the Alamance County Ordinance sections uh, if you need those. If you'll turn the page, there should be an area Alamance County with a yellow sticker on the top left side. That's the location of the site. It's just north of University Drive where Williamson and... I think it backs up to Stone Gables, doesn't it? Yes, sir, it does. So if everybody's familiar with that location, I'll proceed. Uh, if you'll look at the following page, which Ms. Isley has also shown you, there is a green highlighted area surrounding Village Park. This will be the, uh, as proposed, this will be the largest street in Elon. It'll be about 60 feet wide, lined down the middle with landscaping on both sides, framed by large multi-story buildings. You'll see two of those. And then there'll be eight townhomes on the north end of that, uh, on the northern end of that road, which will have addresses. And then you'll see the park, the center of the development, should be in the center of the page. So what we've tried to do between March and now is evaluate all the types of street name combinations, numerical addressing techniques. We've interviewed every section of EMS, sheriff, town fire, town police. We've spoken at length with Ms. Harper and Ms. Isley to try to resolve uh, and come up with a way to utilize this name and protect the response time that the county uh, services are desperately trying to preserve. Secondarily, we're also trying to provide an easy destination for all your secondary delivery people. You have post office, Amazon, you have the pizza delivery, which Ms. Isley referred to me as a traveling citizen. So it's important, number one, that we create a street that matches the community. Number two, it's important that we have a street that the uh, CAD system can identify. And number three, it's important that we maintain a precedent with the ordinance that you all can work with following this case. We have asked that we follow the ordinance, section A, allowing you to hear the appeal. We've interviewed, and I believe, which I'll show you on the final document, I believe we have found a way to uh, alleviate the concerns with EMS and first responders. We've gotten endorsements from the town, from the town police and the town fire, who will be responding to those calls. And if I can take your attention to the last page, I'll, I'll get to the point. It'll be, it'll be third to the last page. Those are endorsements from the county. I'm sorry, from the city. So you are looking for referenced materials at the top of your page. You see the bold underline Alamance County Unified Development Ordinance Section Texts. So those are references we're using. Section 7.2, the administrator, 694, minimum design standards. Master Street Addressing Guide, that is the ordinance, the 2011 ordinance that we are working in currently. Um, and then 7.1.I. So if you'll go to the page preceding this, you'll see in the middle of this page addressing the specific concerns for this request. 
This will just get you to the bottom line, I believe, and then we'll let Miss Isley come uh, speak to uh, what I've said, whether it's accurate. Uh, today, there are 26 road names within Alamance County containing the word park, five names that begin with the word village. Redundancy is not a concern. The ordinance speaks specifically to provide common spellings for English words in the standard dictionary. There are currently no roads or streets named Village Park, Village Park with a C, or Park Village in Alamance County. So redundancy would not be the concern. Let me interject a little bit of uh, commentary here. During some of our technical review meetings in the town of Elon's um, setting, Miss Isley visited, EMS visited, uh, we've spoken with the Sheriff's Department, Elon Fire, Elon Police, etc. We went through a little bit of a trial and error. And if I'm not mistaken, the population of the CAD fields where you type in the words Village Park, when you begin to type Village Park, currently Village Park would populate itself, taking away the human remaining human input. If I begin the term village, P-A-R, if park with a C was adopted, it would populate in the system. If I'm incorrect, Ms. Isley can correct me on that. But I believe we resolved it at that time, so that's the reason we're pursuing this uh, with you this morning. So the second paragraph, given the magnitude of this street, visually combined with the overall length of less than a thousand feet, administrators have a relatively short and isolated length of street to address. That's Ms. Harper behind me. She has to assign addresses to each one of the st uh, structures or buildings there. Administrators also have the ability to assign address numbers in a definitive number range outside of any other streets containing the word park with a K or a C in the county. This technique would provide two identifiers, the address number and the street name, with an additional line of addressing to provide an additional factor of safety for spelling or data entry. There are no other names in Elon beginning with the word park, either phonetically or spelled park with a K. Ballpark Avenue is a street name in Elon. When spoken, ball is completely and phonetically different than park in the ordered pair of words heard by the officer or the operator. The similar logic extends to Elon Park Drive. There is a park road and a park road extension located east of Elon between Elon and Glen Raven, right at the trestle bridge, over 87. Mm -hmm. This road is only two lanes and runs east and west. The proposed village park runs north and south and will be a median divided 60 foot wide city street, completely different than park or park extension. The Beth Schmidt Park is located in Elon, west of town, along the Old Cook Road. Phonetically, Beth Schmidt Park and Village Park are different and spelled completely different. So we believe there is a way to work with this. I would like for Ms. Isley or EMS to come speak to my ordered pair to make sure that I'm accurate, but I believe this is a workable situation and we would appreciate your recommendation. Thank you. I have to wonder how Atlanta does it with peach tree. Every street is peach tree, no matter where you go. That's what it's called. Can I have one other thing? Sure. So one, one, one component that I forgot to mention to you earlier is that we, Park Northwest is one project. We also have another project called Park East, which is adjacent to the site uh, across the intersection. But Park East, we would not be proposing any kind of park theme name for it but it is a sister project and it will share in the same theming same uh, entryways and whatnot but we would not we would not be back down here to ask for another variance in that regard just to just so everybody understands questions mr Turner? um are there any other? Uh, are there any other speakers? Speakers. Anybody, anybody else on this side of the room? Any <coughs> on this side of the room concerning this issue? I just had any a more? question for Ms. Osley. 
could you, you describe a particular scenarios where the safety would be jeopardized by changing the name? I'll go back to the slide with the what the telecommunicator actually sees. So <coughs> when he's referring to Village Park, there are other streets in there with Village already, and the telecommunicator is going to type in what they hear. Park with the K is the phonetically similar what they're going to hear, and that's the standard spelling. And what we're asking them to do is to use Village Park with the K, the standard spelling of the actual street. But if someone calls and they're there and we have um, a visitor to the commercial businesses or someone to the apartments that are going to be there or someone that's going to live there. They're in a high stress situation. It's 911. They may not already automatically think about, let me remember to spell this street P A R C. And those fields in CAD that he's referring to, they don't auto populate, where we're depending on the telecommunicator to type it in and then validate the location of where that caller is calling from. What of his point that if you begin to type village, that the options that that correspond with village appear in the queue? So when you type in village, you're going to get those, the bottom left-hand screenshot, if you can see it from there, you're going to get those options with Villa, Village, Strigo, Village Court, Village Drive, Village Acre Drive, Village Lake, and Villa Way. So you, they still have to go through and they're looking for Village Park with a standard spelling. Okay. Bruce, any way you can make that bigger? Mm. I don't think I can. So Village Park with a C would appear in the queue as would they it, type village, and then they would, they would have to understand that, that's, that that is the actual street. Right, but you're still asking the telecommunicator, and if they see Village Park with a C, yeah. that isn't the automatic first spelling that you're taught in elementary school that Park is with a K. And that telecommunicator is still going to request the caller to spell it each and every single time. Um, what about educating CECOM? Um, operators to, to know that there's a new street in the county and it's got this spelling. Is that doable? We add new streets every day. We add new streets every day, every single week to CECOM, and we do send notifications and emails to them. But we don't dis, just dis, dispatch for Elon. We dispatch for the entire county right. coming across. And so trying to make a telecommunicator remember 14,000 different street names across the county, yeah. we don't want to add any more stress or hassle to their jobs. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. How does CAD deal with Kitchen Street in Burlington? I'm sorry? How does CAD deal with Kitchen Street in Burlington? It's out of order, please. Um, Mr. Lashley? Um, there was, I'm just looking back through here because I uh, just, I like the question that, Ms. that the Commissioner Turner had, but um, it's my understanding that there's there's not a park name. I'm just looking through the information that I was given just to make sure I use the right proper words. But currently there's not a... There's currently not a Village Park Drive or Village Park Street anywhere in the county, but Village is already still there and sure. Park is still there, so they're still going to request them to spell it if they're using a different spelling. Well, I guess my only... I guess my only question is... Well, it's actually a comment, more not more of a question, but a comment that you would think that if a, a corporation or an entity was going to build this particular uh, area, that if PARC is not, P-A-R-K, is not already used, why wouldn't you just go ahead and use that and save this, save this exercise for a later time? That is why we are here. Um, we have requested them to use Village Park with the K, and they can have that one. They can use that one, but they want it to go with their branding with P-A-R-C. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I don't know. I'm just being honest. I don't know. I understand P-A-R-C is, is different. It really is, but it doesn't sound different. You guys, what are you thinking? <laughs> um, but it sounds, the place is going to be such a distinct place anyway, but at the same time, when you're calling on a phone, you don't see it. You hear it. And in the time of a panic, someone's calling 911, anything can get confusing and overwhelming. So, um, I, I don't know. Okay. Mr. Paisley? I really don't have any further comments. Uh, I think the safety issue is my primary concern. Okay. 
The uh, question I had, you said if you type that in, uh, what system were you checking to type it in that when you said you typed, when you started to type village, village park came up? So let me let me be specific um, and answer Mr. Lashley first, mm -hmm. and oh, then sorry, and, and then go to this. Um, in response to Mr. Lashley's, Lashley's question, since Village Park either way was not uh, a name in the county, right? And since branding is critical to this project, and since it is a multi-year destination project, that's the reason we're choosing PARC to answer Mr. Lashley's question. Um, um, would you like to speak at all? Okay, so, dear, I, and Miss Isley might have to help me. <laughs> During our technical review meetings, um, EMS, Mr. Um, Viper, Viperman? Ray Vipperman. Vipperman, sorry, spelling phonetic there example. You go. <laughs> Mr. Vipperman and his assistant, there was a young lady there with us. Uh, gave us the exact process, procedure, and trial run that they did in evaluating Village Park. That's where my information is coming from. Miss Isley was in attendance at that meeting, I believe, but I don't see them in the room. So uh, that is where I got my information through the trial that County EMS or, or CAD did. That's the reason I'm telling you that as, as my understanding of fact. The PARC on your sign, on your entrance, your whole area is is about a standard, and it's a high standard. That's what I'm getting because of that's you know spelling. But we're talking about a 911 call. And standards aren't the deal at that time. Um, this is um, this is uh, quite a conundrum. Commissioners, oh, that word. this is <laughs> commissioners. Um, I've that been that intimately time. involved with this. Back since, since 2011, the whole reason we did this, it took two and a half years to make sure to speed up uh, time for the caller who makes the call and they're in a panic. If we have it set it up right, it can automate a lot of it. We hope it does, but many times it does not. Cell phones have made it worse because they don't even know, if they got pulled over on the side of the road, they had an accident there, they're looking for a sign and they can make all sorts of mistakes. So any part of the process that speeds it up, that's what we do. And we follow the state standards, NINA standards, Wake County rejected this. Again, we welcome them. It's a fantastic yeah. branding, the whole frontage and everything else like that. It's just that, um, and you can approve it and we'll deal. I mean, it's, it's good, but it will add time every time there's a dispatch. So, um, that's just part of the process. That's why we put the appeal process. It's your ultimate decision on it. But this has been vetted for a very long time. The reason you don't have a lot of these kind of appeals is it's been established and been utilized since 2011. Otherwise, you, before them, you, they were inundated with questions. We had street signs that were spelled wrong because the signs were wrong and people wanted to keep those names. So we had a huge cleanup of the entire county and, and angered a lot of folks. But cleaned it up to the point where it helped them safety-wise. And so this has been, you know, around for a long time. And I think we're pretty proud of it. We worked with all our county partners on this. Um, again, with Elon, fire and police, they're the ones who get called and say, hey, go get it. They're not the ones taking the call. And that's where you lose the time. So I just wanted to give you an insight, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago when this was a real problem. Any other questions? Comments? Mr. Paisley? I have one single question. Uh, yeah, we can help name the street, whether it's with a C or a K. Uh, that does not prohibit this development from putting up their own uh, entrance sign or something of that sort. Is that correct or false? Absolutely. So you can have the best of both worlds. You can have the safety, spelling it with K for the, K for the street, and then the entrance sign by the development using the C. Is that correct? Yeah, for the entrance of the, of the whole subdivision, yes. 
Thank you. That's the only question or comment I have. My only comment, Mr. Vice Chairman, is this, that, um, uh, you know, the, thank the, uh, the development group for their interest in Alamance County. And uh, if this were not important, they wouldn't be here today asking for this. Um, the safety issue, I think, is a practical matter. If I'm, a, if I'm somebody on CECOM and I type in the word village and I have, looks like, six or seven options and one of them is park with a C, I think I ought to be able to figure out that that's what this is. Um, to me, the safety concern is with a little bit of education and with that practical um, method of, of sending the call out, I think it's not that significant. I would vote to approve it. That's my thought. A, a vote to approve the request. That's my thought. The motion? I'll make the motion. We have a second. Do we have a motion? Hearing none, do we have a, I'll make a motion to uh, disapprove. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. I'm in favor of what our GIS lady came to us and asked us to do. And that's how I intend to vote. I think I got confused with your motion. Okay. Would you like to make it a little clearer for me, please? <laughs> okay. I'll amend my motion to state that we will um, a motion to approve the recommendations of our GIS tomorrow. And deny the request. And deny yes. the request, yes. Aye. I'll second that motion. <laughs> I thought that's you're what voting I, I, yourself. That's, that's what I thought I had seconded to start with. I just wanted to make I sure. Think you did. I've had a tendency sometimes to get over my skis. <laughs> okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Are you voting on what he just said? Oh, yes. Okay, yes, aye. Yeah. Okay, motion passes. Through. No. 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 Right. <laughs> no, I already knew you said sorry. Okay. That's my fault. Hmm. Yeah, what's, what's, no, what's no in French? Okay, do we have a motion? Do we have a motion to exit public hearing? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, we're back in regular meeting. Uh, Mr. Carter, I think you now need to take the actual vote again outside of the closed session. No. Typically, you close the public hearing, but I think this motion stands whether the public hearing was open or not. All right, thank you. Yeah, I thought that was very good. Okay, Mr. Sullivan. Hey. Good morning. My name is Sky Sullivan. I'm the director of the Family Justice Center, both the collaborative and the county department. I have with me Deetra Betts. Deetra Betts is the executive director of Family Abuse Services, our nonprofit victim service provider in the building. So we are here today to present on Family Justice Center and Family Abuse Services at the request of one of the commissioners to talk a little bit about what our two agencies do in the building, as well as FJC staffing. So every time we come before you, we go over our mission and vision statement. These statements were created by our partners. So we had 27 agencies come together for a shared mission and vision for the entire community. So FJC believes in making our community safer and free of violence through promoting healing, hope, and justice. That's our dream. And how we get there, our mission, the FJC exists to end interpersonal violence through a coordinated response of comprehensive victim-centered empowerment services organized in a single location. So it's a very long way of saying we're a one-stop shop for victims of crime. So a little bit about our history. So our FJC was in the works really early. Um, 
we had a group of leaders go to a Family Justice Center conference in 2005 in San Diego, which was the first in the nation, came back and started planning for a Family Justice Center to be first in North Carolina. In 2008, the commissioners awarded a, um, a building to this collaborative, a county-owned building, and then money to renovate. In 2010, July 8th, 2010, we were the first Family Justice Center in North Carolina to open its doors. 2013, we were first in the nation to implement a complete e-filing system for 50B restraining orders, which is now the model for the country. And we also started our volunteer court navigator program. This is a program that has now uh, been taken over by Family Abuse Services that provides victims a volunteer in court to sit with them through the entire process. In 2015, we launched a lethality assessment program, which uh, we launched with Burlington Police Department. This is a lethality screen we do on site with a victim. Law enforcement conducts that screen. It's 11 questions. If they screen in as high risk, they automatically call family abuse services from the scene. Uh, this is a homicide reduction tool. They found that victims who were murdered by their abuser, about 4% ever interacted with victim services. So our, our goal is to close that gap. 2016, we were awarded an OVW grant, Office on Violence Against Women, for the Elder Justice Project. This was a project that was really spearheaded by the DA's office, um, but coordinated by the Family Justice Center. And it required a lot of partners to come together to serve victims who are 50 plus. That is the federal definition of elder, not mine. Um, but 50 plus, we do have a lot of citizens in this county who are at that age range. We do have retirement communities. We have victims experiencing a lot of the time financial exploitation, um, neglect, or abuse by a caregiver or family member in their home. 2017, we launched a centralized intake process for the FJC. Up until 2017, um, partners would come to the door for any crisis, mainly family abuse services, to deal with what was going on. Uh, we have a lot of folks who show up to us with family issues, mental health issues, homelessness, just experiencing some kind of um, uh, issue that does not pertain to a victimization. And so we implemented a centralized intake process where Family Justice Center staff do an intake and then figure out the next best place for them to go. 2021, the commissioners approved the creation of a domestic violence fatality review team of which we will have our first annual report ready for you next month. 2022, we became our own county department. So 2009 until 2022, um, Family Justice Center started under the sheriff's office for a brief amount of time, then went under Department of Social Services, and then we became our own department July 1st of 2022. So that is the first time you ever saw a budget or any kind of um, staffing for the Family Justice Center. And then 2023, you all approved for us to start a Camp Hope co cohort for children who have experienced trauma or witnessed trauma, and that's the first program of its kind in Alamance County. There's a lot of history to try to condense down into a timeline, so we just kind of picked the highlights to go over. Of course, there's a lot more that this collaborative has been doing. So to talk a little bit about Family Justice Center staff, we have 44 professionals in the building from 12 different agencies. Family Justice Center has, uh, at this point, six staff in the building and then two offsite. FJC director and a front desk specialist were established when the building opened. And then we added that centralized intake process in 2017. So in preparation, added a part-timer and then a full-time person to navigate or to do those intakes. On a daily basis, it could be four intakes, it could be 26. It depends on how many people come through the door. We also added a client services coordinator in 2017. And then with the Elder Justice Project, we added a coordinator for, through that grant and a Elder Abuse Services Coordinator for our um, partners. The coordinator position did go away when the grant went away. That was the nature, that was the design of the grant and just left us with one person who does case management for victims that are 50 plus. We do have a victim liaison who is housed at the sheriff's office, so she is off-site and works with their special victims unit. And then the domestic violence intervention program, it's most commonly known as abuser treatment program. That was established in the county in 2005, uh, back when there was some kind of uh, court services department or justice department, and when that department dissolved, that position went under DSS and eventually under FJC. So it's currently located un under FJC. They do not operate in the Family Justice Center. No abusers receive services at the Family Justice Center. Do y'all have any questions about staffing? 
I know I speak really fast, so I just want to make sure. <laughs> Wait, uh, Ms. Ms. Thompson? I'm good. Okay. Lashley? I'm fine, too. Thank you. Thank you. Paisley? No, thank you for your presentation. I, 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 I got to say, this is something Alamance County really needs to be proud of. I mean, it's a, quite a program. I hear constantly good things about it. So. Thank you. Well, we're about halfway through, so I just wanted to take a break and give you all a second and we'll continue on with our partnerships. So we have right now 12 different partners in the building. We do have one pending to bring in peer support services, and as soon as that contract's approved, we're gonna add them to the list. Um, some of these partners were day one partners, but some of them have been added over the years of, as the needs have grown in the center. As I said, we have 44 professionals from 12 partner agencies on site. Um, number six, RHA Health Services, what is that? So they provide a therapist to do mental health counseling with victims. On your site? Uh, on site, yes. That is the, the contract. They have had some staffing challenges, so we haven't had a therapist since November. But we are hopeful they are able to hire someone soon. Is that change in Via? So RHA is the service provider, and Via is the uh, MCO, the management of the service providers. Is there, with just shortages for RHAs, that one, is there any other body that's doing those services? Yes, and we are contracting with a second agency to hopefully come in and provide those services. So RHA, which is our on-site mental health specialist <coughs> that's moving into the diversion center, you're having to subcontract, kind of, sort of, is that the right word? Yes. Another service due to their shortages? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. All right, these are our offsite partners. We cannot put every agency in the county on this list, so we kind of picked who we call and work with most often. This is a mixture of partners with um, other, we have another victim service agency offsite that works with children, so that's Crossroads. We work with them, the school system, clerk of court, the court systems, um, and then we have specific partners for our elder justice project, and those are sprinkled in through here as well. So picking relevant stats for y'all is really hard. I love statistics and I really could give you a whole spreadsheet of everything that we do. Tried to pick the five that would really represent what we've been doing. So since we opened in July of 2010, we have served a total of 14,180 victims, 19,154 times. This is just in person. We also serve folks over the phone, um, and electronically, and then family abuse services goes to other locations. This does not capture who is being served at the hospital, in court, at different law enforcement jurisdictions. These are folks walking through the doors of the Family Justice Center. Between 2011 and 2022, about said 2012, demand for services has increased by 192%. First year we opened, we served a little over 450 victims. We are now um, averaging about 2,000 a year. So we are going up significantly in who is coming to the door and demanding services. Since 2013, the FJC has e-filed 4,324 restraining orders on site. So victims who need what's called a domestic violence protective order, 50B restraining order, they're all the same thing. Instead of sitting in the clerk's office or sitting in uh, taking up space in a courthouse, they come to us to file that paperwork. The process takes about three hours. Um, and as I said, Alamance does some magical things. We were the first in the nation to do this uh, e-filing process. So they come in, they have an intake, and then Family Abuse Services spends about three hours with them filling out the paperwork, filing. Then we have someone from the Sheriff's Office that coordinates the filing. Um, clerk of Court comes on a screen and swears them in. The judge comes on the screen, does a hearing. Sheriff's Office is in the building. They go serve the perpetrator from the FJC. Everything is done in-house. The victim does not have to go anywhere. Before we had an FJC in this e-filing process, on average, a victim had to go to nine different places to get this process completed. So that is all in-house now. There are an average of 3,000 referrals made to on-site partners every year. So Family Justice Center staff do that intake and then make the right referral. We don't do an intake every single time someone comes in, just the first time they come in and do that danger assessment. On average, my staff do about 1,500 intakes per year, 75 to 80% actually get through the process to a victim service provider, which is Family Abuse Services. We do about, it could be, I think the lowest I've seen is 17 in a month and the highest I've seen is 40, where a citizen is not at the right place, but they need help, they are in crisis. 
So that's where my staff comes in to make sure that precious resources like a victim service agency isn't spending hours helping someone having a mental health crisis or who is homeless looking for a shelter to go to because they are already above capacity of who's coming in who needs help from their service, their, their agency. So your staff does the intake and then it's handed over to Family Abuse Services? That is correct. Yeah. So I'll go through the client flow. I'm sorry this didn't show up as big as I wanted it to. Um, so client comes to the FJC, they get a warm welcome by our front desk specialist, and then we check for a conflict. We're making sure that person is not a violent offender um, or the other party on a case that we are currently working with. So FJC staff can screen out folks from that, that uh, 1,500 that we do. They could be the offender in the case. Um, they could be in the wrong place. We're getting a lot of folks coming to us where there is substance abuse involved in their home and their family members trying to take custody of children. That is not something that we have the ability to help with or the expertise in. They still need help getting to their next right place. Those can take us an hour plus. Um, and that never leaves FJC staff that, um, or goes to the victim service agency. So we move them into a room. They do their paperwork, we go through confidentiality and intake, and then we do a danger assessment. That comprehensive danger assessment gives them a number on how high risk they are. Danger assessments 10 and above are high risk cases. We average 17 on our clients. Um, that really isn't exceptional to us because it takes folks being in high risk situation to come seek help. Uh, we're not a place you go to when you're just, you're in that pre-contemplative stage. That's after law enforcement has been out, CPS has been out. Um, folks don't want to come out and say, this is happening in my home, right? So we expect the high risk cases are coming to us. The navigator does that intake, and then once the intake is complete, we are referring to all of our partner agencies on site. The little bubbles around number six, those are the different uh, services that our providers on site can provide to them. So we're navigating them. I will say 99% of victims who come to the front door are going to family abuse services first because they're in crisis. They need safety planning, they need a safe place to go, um, they may need a restraining order, whatever that looks like. After that, our, the FJC staff go back and say, what else does this victim need? And then we are going to do all of the referrals to our partners on site. We manage everyone's calendar so that when a victim comes back for an appointment, we know um, who they're meeting with. Most people come back, they don't know all 12 agencies on site. They say, I have an appointment today. And we look at the calendar, okay, you have an appointment with our attorney. You have an appointment for high lethality safety planning. You have an appointment for a forensic interview. We can kind of coordinate them in the right direction. So we're a lot of administrative support. Mm -hmm. We also administer the uh, grant funding that we have for financial assistance for all of our partners. So this pot fluctuates between 24,000 and 80,000 per year, depending on which grants we have. This is a low year, it's $24,000. Uh, the Elder Justice Project gave us a lot of client financial assistance that we don't have access to now that project has ended. But for our partners so that they can spend their time working with the client, we're gonna arrange um, emergency drop in daycare, a bus pass, relocation, that could be a train ticket, a plane ticket, uh, lock changes, emergency hotel placements, gas cards, et cetera. Um, we also hand out things like security cameras and, and things like that for general overall safety. That way our partners, again, can continue serving their clients. They bring us a form, this is what we need, and then our staff work on the background to get it all coordinated for them so they can continue providing services. We also have the Elder Abuse Services Coordinator who's providing case management for victims who are 50 plus. This is really important because there are a lot of people who screen out of adult, adult protective services because they do not want services. And when somebody has competency and free will, they can say, I elect to not receive any of these services. So DSS can send us that case, law enforcement can send us that case, and then we have a person who's not really connected to either agency calling them and saying, would you like to come talk to me? Uh, that is our resident expert, Latanya Hall. Uh, she's been with the county for, I believe, 25 years now. So she's been a social worker for a very long time doing this work. Um, and we have a high success rate with uh, elder victims coming in. The biggest barrier we face is elder victims are ashamed to tell us what's happening, especially when it's a family member. They don't want to get grandson in trouble or son in trouble or their caretaker who might be the only person they see that week. Um, so we're trying to build relationships with that one. We see our elder clients more often than we do um, any victim under 50 because we have to build some trust. We also have a forensic interview space for law enforcement to use, so we coordinate that for them. And then, as I said, all of the uh, referrals in the building. Um, one question. Yes. The emergency hotel placements, is the Justice Center solely responsible financially for that service since that 
another shelter when I worked there 100 years ago is no longer actually there. And I'm just curious, are, has Family Abuse Services got any skin in the game with finances for that, or is that solely on the Justice Center? That is an excellent question. Um, and I will actually let Deetra jump in on that one. Yes, we um, also, through some of our grant um, funders, have client, client support services where we'll pay um, hotel accommodations for individuals that need it in that crisis, especially during after hour times, during the weekends and uh, things of that sort. We have a collaboration with uh, one of the hotels to provide a discounted rate for us to provide those services with a confidential name for them and have that process set up to make sure that they have somewhere to go in that immediate um, crisis situation. So you're both putting into that pot of money? Mm-hmm. Um, so their pot of money is separate from yeah, ours? Yeah, it's separate. So we have Council for Women, we have GCC, right. we have, you know, we have the different pots that we can allocate towards um, any type of client assistance that's needed. So it could be even relocation, getting a plane ticket, same, in the same process, but a different, different um, entity. How is that decided? Because if I'm not mistaken, and please correct me if I'm wrong, last year presenting, you or the FJC had over, what, about 37000 in money for emergency housing services so is that that's totally different or are you both doing that do you know what i'm trying to say are you both providing that service we provide that service we both provide the service but it depends on how much money we have we don't have as much money as the fjc does at the at sometimes mm -hmm. so when we get to the end of a grant cycle say like we're if we're in July, well, we're in August now, so some of our funding has not even come right. towards us, and so that's when we reach out to FJC to um, kind of supplement those deficits. Okay. And, and something I'll add real quick is that this demand has really skyrocketed since COVID started. Um, quality affordable housing is difficult enough for just a regular citizen. And then when you're a victim fleeing and your abuser has control of your bank accounts or your paycheck or any kind of money to get to that next place, um, the, the highest population we serve is women with children, right? So we're helping them with deposits, we're helping them with um, utility deposits and then first month's rent. That bulk service is really done by Family Abuse Services. So they have money for rapid rehousing, they have housing money to help them get to their next place. What we're helping with is, okay, they need a place to stay for three nights until they get, until their mom can come up here or until that next place. Um, we do not provide that after hours though. Um, when Family Abuse Services, when their main shelter closed, that was a really challenging process and getting to who answers that call at three in the morning for a victim. I'm very happy to say it is no longer my cell phone that's ringing at three in the morning for hotels. They, it rings for other reasons. Um, but it is Family View Services 24 seven crisis line. So it's taken some time to work out a process for our community and it's based on who you know and getting to all of these new patrol officers and new folks at CECOM. And you know, there's a lot of different agencies that have had high turnover for the past couple years. Um, every time our partner agencies have turnover, we have to go in and retrain, and we're also really, really busy right now. We are seeing the highest numbers in our entire 13-year history, so it, it's just a hard time in general uh, to get out there. But I would love for you to talk more about Family yes. Abuse Services. So Family Abuse Services is one of the many partnering agencies in the FJC. Um, I've been with Family Abuse Services for a little, little over a year now. Um, and so it's, I find it to be a very um, rewarding process. As Sky had indicated, the, the, front end, the front end portion allows us to do the more in-depth crisis components of the individuals that come in. Um, some of the F FAS services are civil and criminal court accompaniment, um, crisis intervention walk-ins, so providing emotional support, safety planning, protection orders, referrals to other community partners. Sometimes we have people just call, they just want to talk through processes, determining whether or not they, you know, the relationships they're in, if they want to leave. So just having that supportive services um, on staff. We have short-term emergency housing, so we do have units where individuals can come in when we have space available to provide those um, it's temporary but more longer term than hotel stays. With the hotel stays, um, 
if there's a couple of days, it gives them time, if it's the weekend, to come into the FJC so we can do a, a further in-depth assessment of their needs. Because sometimes being in Alamance County isn't the best option for their safety. So just figuring out which, um, which direction they need to go into. Um, we also do community education, outreach, and violence prevention programs throughout the community. We have support groups for both English and Spanish speaking individuals. We just launched our Spanish speaking support group with the Dream Center so individuals can get those services as well. We do legal aid service referrals to Elon Law or legal aid depending on their needs, um, lethality assessment program, and supervised visitation. Um, for the past six months, um, some of our number of services that we have, um, clients serve. We served 688 clients within the past six months. For our um, client services, within those clients being served, they were provided with 6,319 services um, over the past six months. And it, it varied based on their needs. So everyone had a different need, and we try to individualize with that trauma-informed and empowerment model for them to determine what their needs are and then provide those resources for them. With emergency housing, um, we've housed 1,000 um, well, we had 1,850 shelter nights that were provided and that were averaged about 37.8 nights per family. And then uh, with hotel accommodations, we had 56 hotel accommodations, 54 of them being new and then two of them returning um, after they had received the services with hotels prior to that. And then with supervised visitation, we have 18 families that have been served in the past six months, and there were not 194 visits completed. When you have a situation where you decide that it's not safe for them to stay within the county, mm -hmm. um, I don't know whether to ask this question or not, but <laughs> what are your options? We reach out to other shelter programs out of the area. Um, we determine based on that individual's family, like do they have family outside of this right. area? So it just depends on that situation. So we reach out to those resources out there. And if there's a victim service agency in that area that they want to go to, we'll make contact with them to see how they can assist them once they get to that location. Um, finding transportation, sometimes if we have funding to provide a train ticket or a plane ticket to that location, we can work that out. And sometimes that, that agency on the other end is able to collaborate with us and, and then with the FJC as well. So it just depends on that situation situation and the cost if we have that All right. any other questions Bill very interesting Beg your it's very interesting mm -hmm. presentation um, just for clarification when mm -hmm. somebody walks in and your person does the intake are your employees your advocates or that terminology is now, mm -hmm. are they doing the actual 50B e-filing? Yes. So you're the walk them to that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So our staff are very much like a triage. Okay. So um, kind of like what y'all are planning with the diversion center. They come in and somebody has to figure out why are you here? Are you in the right place? When? What was the most recent incident? And then which service provider needs to see you right now? Intakes last between 15 and 30 minutes. We are not getting their whole story. It is what was the most recent incident and doing a danger assessment so Family Abuse Services knows this was the correct person to come here. Um, let me go back to some stats. So not everyone who comes to the door is appropriate for services. And sometimes, it, as I said before, they're having a substance abuse or mental health crisis, a homelessness crisis, um, and our staff will take them kind of back and figure out where's the next best step for you. What we don't want is to ever turn someone away at the door and just say, nope, you're not in the right place. That happens to a lot of folks, and by the time they get to us, they are really upset and they say, this is the fifth or sixth place I've been to, can you help me? And that's really hard for us to not, as social workers, help them with something. Um, but no, our staff are really there to provide more of that behind the scenes administrative support so our partners can do their jobs. Now more than ever, this infrastructure is really important because grant funding is at a almost 20 year low. So we used to operate with 112, I believe it was $112 million worth of VOCA, Victims of Crime Act funding in North Carolina that came through the Governor's Crime Commission. Um, that went down to 56 and then 34. We're looking at another cut next year, um, possibly as low as 26 or 24 million for the entire state. 
Um, that is very comparable to what your DSS department in a single county's budget is. That is very low to fund victim services, law enforcement agencies, um, just all these different programs. And they've added more categories. So now we compete with hospitals and, and large systems for this same small pot of money. So for family abuse services, um, they took a 57% cut last year in VOCA funding and the state I think made up I'm going to guess like a thousand or two, two thousand. It wasn't a yeah. lot that the state came in. Um, for other avenues, the state came in and funded those services. So, like your child advocacy centers, they took a huge cut and got a huge increase of state money to help fund those centers. Domestic violence service <coughs> providers did not. So, the entire state shares about $9.5 million for every DV agency. In a lot of counties, these agencies are closing, and it is becoming the responsibility of the county to provide services. So we have some neighbor, neighboring counties, their domestic violence agencies closed, and they had to figure out really quick, how do we provide these services? This FJC infrastructure in communities like ours, Gaston, Guilford, Buncombe, this has really saved our partnerships and our agencies from having to close their doors, reduce hours, or turn victims away at the door. And just to tag on that, because I, everything you're saying, I've been saying that for the last two years sitting as a commissioner because I see those. And um, there were so many agencies that did not get funded. And what we're seeing is like the big, the big things, like the Walmarts compared to the 7-Elevens. And your 7-Elevens are the ones that do the in-your-face real grunt work for this mm -hmm. kind of thing. And um, it's a real scary time. I was reading about Orange County sexual assault where they've been whacked and they're going to have to look at cutting their prevention stuff in the schools. Mm -hmm. And that means you're losing positions. And when you lose positions, you're going to lose services because like DSS, one person can't do 19 mm -hmm. social right. workers' yeah. jobs. Right. It seems to be that that seems to be the mindset just with the whole country when it comes to law and order and crime and everything else. And we got to be really careful because I know during COVID, when I was on the school board, DSS reports tripled once coming out. And you guys are getting ready to, school's going to start. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some little kids that are going to be singing like birds about what they've experienced this summer. And then what are you going to do? Because you just said you're having to subcontract out for mental health services. I want to know what, how are you going to work with the diversion center if that's the case, if they're kind of short? Because everybody's short mm -hmm. on staff, no matter what it is. You're seeing at restaurants, you're seeing in everything, mm -hmm. but yeah. your abuse is not no. short. <laughs> our numbers are higher than they've ever yeah. been. Mm -hmm. and, and that real impact to us and our partners, we feel that every day. Mm -hmm. um, it, we've got very high turnover in our partner agencies. It's really hard to train people. It, I feel like it takes three years to fully grasp mm -hmm. what you're doing. And when you have folks a year in who are leaving to go to other jobs are saying, I, I can't do this. This right. is hard work. Yeah. This impacts your mental health, your emotional health, your physically. Um, you take that home with you. Our officers, our social workers, our attorneys, all of our folks struggle tremendously with the work they do. And then we have higher numbers than we've ever had. And self-care is the least self-caring in this business because oh. you're too busy taking care of everybody else. Mm -hmm. You can't bubble bath your way out of right. uh, listening to traumatic stories right. all day, right? right. So, um, But the, again, this partnership has been so vital for our community because during COVID, we didn't close. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't see our agencies closing. And that's really a testament to the uh, collaboration of our on-site partners. We could not do this day in and day out without the, the partners that I listed before. Um, they are very dedicated to what we do and to the victims we serve. And every time I have to knock on a door and say, hey, so we need you to increase capacity because we have increased victims coming to the door. Uh, Sheriff's Office doesn't say, no, we're not going to go out and investigate more crimes. Or um, Family Abuse Services doesn't say, no, we can't handle more referrals. It just means sometimes we're all staying after hours. We're getting more calls on weekends. Um, we're very lucky if we get to have a lunch break or go to the bathroom in the middle of the day, right? Because we're trying to meet the needs of the citizens coming to the door. And we're, we're very proud of the partnership that we have in Alamance County. It is the model for the state. We have won national awards for the work we do here. I don't know what's in the water here, but there's something about Alamance County that, that really puts y'all on or us on the forefront. I've been here eight years. You think I'd say us now. Um, on the forefront of, of victim services. 
Well, I know when I served on the Domestic Violence Commission for six years, that was always the first question. Other law enforcement leads that would present to our commission would say, well, what are y'all doing? And I said, we just don't get in each other's way and focus on the victim. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes a lot of ego pushing it out of the way because um, nobody owns the victim. We all do when it comes to helping them. So that's a big deal to be known for collaboration. You don't have that often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, believe me, we host a ton of tours from other communities mm -hmm. asking, how do y'all do this, <laughs> right? Um, and and it's, it's very exciting to get to share what we do. I think it re-energizes all of us. I'm like, this is the hope. This is the reason we do this. Mm -hmm. Plus, I like to brag, so. <laughs> well, I will say, I was at the coffee shop where my office is, and, um, and two unknown people from Family Abuse Service were in there doing their work in the court system. And I just point blank asked them, and they said, we could not do it without the Family Justice Center. So that tells me your sister companies, which tells me you are really making sure that complete victim has services, right. which is you got to or you die. Mm -hmm. You yeah. just die. Yeah, that hadn't stopped <laughs> at all. Yeah. Murder, suicides. It's just awful. Mm -hmm. Well, we literally couldn't do that without them because they do the, the long haul work <laughs> yeah. with the victims too. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for taking the time today to listen about Family Abuse Services and Family Justice Center. I just have a question. When we first moved in, that um, Richard Hill, that landfill czar, was over the building. And we were told that we could not use more than 10 inches of toilet paper because it was a green building. And he would come over there like, you know, what are you doing? He was, he was all about that because it's an air system that flushes the toilets. It's a green building. It was the first of its kind when they remodeled everything. He was on us. All the women in that building, he thought he was going to tell us how to go to the bathroom. He's at the landfill. That's all I'm going to say. So, hmm. I'm not kidding. He was on it. That man is so conscientious about this county. He could run it. The world. So, but Yeah, toilet paper was a big deal. We don't I, want to keep nothing out here. We're all about being transparent. But I, I would welcome Joel to come have a conversation with yes. us. That is not our top priority right now, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I hear that. that. You don't want a bunch of us sitting around asking you questions, do you? Please don't ask women what we do in the bathroom. We don't, we don't want to answer. He just took a lot of pride in that building. I mean, uh -huh. he was all over it, but we threatened his life a couple of times. He laid up a little bit. So. Mr. Turner, right. any more comments or questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Last <laughs> good. Thank you so much. Enjoy it. Mr. Paisley. Very informative. Uh, yes, <clears throat> yes, sir, I do. Uh, one, I just want to make a comment. When the e-filing started, uh, Judge Jim Robson was heavy duty into that and is to be complimented. I think it's, uh, as, as you've already pointed out, that is major with the first in the entire state and Jim Robson needs to be uh, thanked for that. Uh, the second, we approved, uh, and I say we, uh, the budget approved for outside agencies, uh, which included Crossroads in the budget that we just passed, and that is how essential those outside agencies have been. Uh, if we aren't required to fund them, but we do because they do such tremendous work. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks, very much. We Thank appreciate you. what you do very right. much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Mr. Aiken, you've got the rest of the day just about. Uh, wow. No pressure. <laughs> Promise to keep it under two hours. Okay. <laughs> I'll promise to stay away. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell anybody. That's good. I was just happy earlier uh, when uh, Commissioner Thompson was asked to spell something that it wasn't me. I'm a math person. I live on spell check. Just breathe a sigh of relief at that moment. Uh, so thank you for letting me come before you today. I've got a number of items, so I'll try to move through them relatively quickly. Uh, so the first item is the annual settlement of taxes. Uh, these are our taxes from uh, tax year 22 through 23. These are the bills we issued last year. Uh, and each year I come before this board to uh, give a, an account for what we've done in collecting the taxes. So for 2022, our total levy was $93,577,915.66. Um, of that, we collected 
$92,622,054.54, leaving an amount uncollected of $955,861.12. That is a collection rate of 98.98. So how does that uh, compare? Is that a, a good rate? Um, it is what we call points. It's two points down from last time. That's two hundredths of a percent uh, down from last year. Uh, but when you compare it to the five-year average, um, our average is 98.79, median at 98.71. Uh, this is pretty good for recent years. Uh, I have to admit to perhaps have been a little distracted in the past year. I, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> But I, I feel very good that we were able to collect what we did. That's very close to the 99 from last year. When you look at the collection rate over time, you can see that there is a kind of an up and down but general state of decline until 2013. From that time, it's been generally up. Um, this year being one step down from last year, which was our highest year, uh, meaning this is our second highest year on record. Uh, now, I don't know what happened prior to 20 years ago, uh, but for the records I have, this is our second highest year. So I do feel good about 98.98. Uh, one measure would be to compare us to other counties. So uh, every year we look at our fellow counties. We compare based on population, uh, the total valuation, the density of value per population. So this is telling us, is it more built up? Is it more rural? The median household income. We also weed out any coastal or mountain counties because their economies are largely uh, tourism-driven, sales-driven, not as much property tax-driven. And from those, we find the most similar counties. Our most similar counties are Pitt, Rowan, Davison, Randolph, and Catawba. You'll see that they have an average of 98.71%, and of course, we're at 98.98, so we feel we're doing well as compared to our peers. Uh, there's always a few overachievers in there, um, but that just tells us that we have uh, something to aspire to, that there's uh, room for growth. I would like to point out that each year we seem to be handling more funds than the prior year. Uh, we processed an additional $1.8 million this year above the prior year. And so it's uh, a lot of hard work going on in our department. And I want to take the opportunity uh, to thank our collection staff, uh, Cindy, Kathy, Michelle, Jamie, Penny, Renee, and Candy. Uh, these are the folks that are doing the actual on-the-ground work, uh, both collecting payments at the counter and, unfortunately, for those who do not care to pay, going out and doing the garnishments, taking the actions that we need to, to bring that money in. Uh, when we have a good rate like we do this year, uh, it's nice to be able to stand up here and be the, the face of the tax department and say we've got a good collection rate. Uh, but the reality is that these are the folks that are doing the work, and, and I'm very thankful for that. I also want to thank the board for its support. Uh, you know, one of the things about being your tax administrator is I'm very fortunate. Uh, I've been supported by the board. I've been supported by management. I've got a great team that I work with every day. So if we have good results, that's really probably other things happening. I just get to step in and be the face of. Uh, if anything is messed up, it's probably me. Uh, but I've been well supported, and I'm very thankful for that. Quick question. Yes. Um, have we done any sort of a study to see what the composition is of, of what's creating that $955,000 uncollected? Sure. It's a blend. Um, the majority of the uncollected is our real and um, general personal property, like business personal property. Over the lifetime, uh, we do collect most of that. For example, if I look back, uh, it should be in your packet, to uh, 2013, uh, we've collected, as of this date, matter of fact, this is my next item, um, down to just 91,000 remaining. We've got 99.87% collection. So because we do collect over 10 years, we bring uh, that in. But that's mostly uh, real and uh, business personal will be the big items there. Mm -hmm. So the next item that I have on the agenda relates to that. Uh, this is a request to write off 10-year-old taxes. So the statutes give us 10 years to enforce collections on uh, accounts that the, the owner chooses not to pay. 
after that 10 years passes, we could still receive payment. We don't have to write it off, but we have no tools in our toolbox. It's basically voluntary. The thought being, if you've gone 10 years and, and we've not been able to compel it, uh, when we no longer have the power to compel, the odds of payment are very low. The county has always written off 10-year-old taxes each year. Uh, this year will be 2013, and in your packet, you'll see that at the end of the fiscal year, uh, we had $91,019.77 outstanding. As of this morning, that was 88577 and 88 cent. So we're continuing to collect. We'll continue to collect through the end of the month. Uh, the actual date that we lose our enforcement powers is September 1st. So through the end of August, we'll get in what we can, uh, get this number as far down as we, as we can go. So these are situations where there's no option for us mm -hmm. to pursue. There's no, no, uh, mm -hmm. no uh, closure issues or right. anything mm -hmm. else that we can do. Mm -hmm. All right, so some of the property is not real property, so unless you can lay hands on it, you can't levy it. Personal, you have to go and physically impound it. Real property, we can we can always get. If it is real property, sometimes you have issues um, if there's um, some unusual ownership situations where property has transferred back and forth and kind of muddied the water between the portion that you've got a lien on and the portion you don't have a lien on. It can kind of um, make things murky. Now, with this being 2013, we're just exiting that problem. The Register of Deeds requires taxes to be paid, and then you have to get a certification here. So that's uh, less of an issue. Uh, back in the day, that was a big issue. You'd have delinquent properties changing hands, being split and recombined, and that's no longer a problem for us. So with 2013, that problem goes away? Right. 2013, I don't think, would be affected by that. I, I went into my normal routine. Well, here are the problems we face, but I think 2013, we've actually cleared it at this point. It's all under that practice, which is a huge help for us. You'd have bankruptcy, some things we can't get to because of bankruptcy. Uh, and again, personal property, if you can't find somebody and they've left and you can't grab the personal property, odds of collecting it are virtually zero. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Paisley. Uh, I think we need to take a vote on 7B before we take up 7C. Mr. Chair, I think that was just a report, yeah. but uh, I don't think there's a vote required on that. I'm looking at the attorney. He, he can take a vote to accept it for sure if you sure. would like. No, um, do we have a motion to accept a presentation by the tax minister? Yeah. We have a motion to accept the presentation on 7B. Sure. I'll second it. Uh, okay. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Approved. That was easy. What if we don't accept it? <laughs> So while we're in the mood for a motion, uh, I request a motion. <laughs> I request a motion. Uh, now that to, we've got a trend, right? Uh, right. Got to go with momentum. Uh, request a motion to be able to write this off effective right. as of September 1st. Now, um, we will have, um, let's say that we, we issue a garnishment the last day of August. It processes. We may continue to get payments for months, and so we'll allow that to run until it runs out. But once it stops, we can't reattach it. We've lost that ability, and so we'll, at that point, write that off. So I'm just trying to work this through in my head. Let's say somebody mm -hmm. has a motor vehicle. Mm -hmm. They didn't pay their taxes on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they relocated out of state, I presume, then, because that would be the only way they could get another license plate mm -hmm. issued. Sure. That would be a situation where we would have a hard time collecting the it, it would taxes be. on it. Mm -hmm. And another situation that we're countering are what we call gap bills. So the person has a lapse in the registration. They go and renew at the DMV, and they pay taxes right then and there for the year ahead, and there's a, a number of missing months in between the lapse and the new registration. So we're then sent the information to bill that. We're, we're charged with billing that and we serve the individual, here's maybe three months' worth of taxes. Well, what happens is that it's not due. If, if, for example, if that occurred today, uh, we're, we're fortunate because September 1st is coming. Let's say this occurs in the month of September. We would serve the person with a bill and say it's not due until a year from now, 
and then it's not enforceable for another four months grace period. So by the time we get to there, maybe a few more months and we get something noticed out to them, it's been approaching two years and it may have been a bill for $20 two years ago. And they received it right after they paid taxes at the DMV. They're like, I paid this. It goes in the trash can. Now they will argue vehemently, I, I never received a bill. Now, I can't say that they did. Sometimes you don't. But I also suspect it was two years ago, you probably disregarded it because you had just paid taxes to renew. You probably received a bill. So that, that can be problematic. Uh, and again, if we can get a hold of the person, we have a high success rate with getting that paid. We, we show them that there's an obligation. Very few people argue with that. They, they may complain. They'll say, I didn't get a bill, but I'll be glad to pay the principal. Um, and we, we go down that road. Um, if that person cannot be found, if they've left the county, left the state, running wherever they're going, that bill's not going to get paid. So it doesn't follow them wherever mm -hmm. they go? The obligation remains, but we have to be able to get a hold of something to enforce on. And so if, if they are not in an available situation for us to garnish a wage or hit a bank account, we do have a practice. Uh, we never run an enforcement with a fee higher than the principal. That's just the decision that we've made, I've made years ago. Uh, you got somebody with $5 indebtedness, and you're going to serve $30 to them, $30 to the bank. They're going to pay $60 in fees over a $5 bill. I, I, I have a problem with that, so I don't do that. Um, it may be something that, that we should do. That's just a decision I made years ago. Is you know, Beside which, where are you going to put your energy? I've got someone out here that owes $5,000. And that's one who owes five, $5. And I'm going to task my staff with going and getting the $5 bill and charge them $60 in fees. Or am I going to get that $5,000 bill? Well, that's the one I'm going to collect. So it's not very problematic. It also helps us to refocus on the larger accounts to bring in the most money. Maybe what we need to do is require the name of the church they belong to. Yeah. Churches never lose track mm -hmm. of anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Round them up. Pam, now come on. <laughs> we have resorted to calling family members. We will look them up and find their family. Yes, I need to talk to so-and-so. They owe taxes. We're resourceful. But we don't always get it. Uh, do we have a motion on 7C? Uh, what's the total you're looking to write off? So as of this morning, it's down to 88000 577 and 88 cents. You can see we're down a few thousand from the end of the year. Uh, we won't know that total until we hit write off because we're still digging on it, but it would be that amount or less. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. All right. The third item is the order of tax collection. Uh, this is sometimes called the charge. Right. I'm, I'm here to be charged today, and I told my wife that the, the Board of County Commissioners will hopefully be charging me, and she <laughs> said, I, I thought you were into something, you know. Um, what this is charging me with is a, a duty to collect taxes, and specifically, uh, this is giving me authority to use the remedies and statute to collect. So if I need to garnish or attach or do anything like that, this is ordering me, you know, Go and collect it. Use the powers uh, available to you to do so. Now, we choose to do that at this time of year, even though the 23 taxes are not delinquent yet. I've already got that authority for 22 and older. 23 taxes just came out. They're not delinquent. Why do I need that now? There are a few rare circumstances where you would go ahead and use those powers prior to delinquency. And so to have that right here at the beginning available, should a situation arise, I could immediately act and not wait for the next meeting to ask for authority to act. So we normally do that at this time. Uh, and that is a, a motion uh, to give me the order of tax collection. Do we have a motion? So moved. Well, aren't you kind of ordered to t collect it anyway? I am. It's just a different sort of deal. It, a formality. Yes, it is a bit of a formality. Uh, but it authorizes me if I need to, to garnish or really to levy. The, the, the thing that we're looking at at this juncture uh, that would be the early situation is a business that doesn't pay pro their property taxes that uh, announce that they're leaving the county. 
that you could go and impound and levy and say, pay us before you go. And, and that's the one time where you'd use it this early. Later on, it would be garnishments and other things. I'm sorry, did we have a second? Yes. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, thank you. Unanimous. All right. So on to the last item. Uh, I've been asked to talk about um, that there have been some concerns raised recently about how the revaluation impacted different types of properties and just wanted to kind of go over that uh, with you and uh, answer some of the concerns that I've heard. And my, my first point is that we talk about the real estate market as if it's one market, but it's really many sub-markets that we are grouping together. And anytime I'm appraising something, I'm not interested in the market, I'm interested in the sub-market that it lives in. Um, a good way to, to think about this is if you've got somebody that's interested in buying a home out in the rural part of the county, they're probably not looking for a town home in the middle of the city. Uh, these are both part of the real estate market, but these are different markets. Those are not the same buyers. Um, if you need a large home, you've got a, a large family, you need five bedrooms, you're not going to look at a two-bedroom home. Right? They're both in the real estate market, but they're in different sub-markets. These are not the same buyers that are involved. Or if you're looking for an office space, right? there may be a factory available. You're not going to buy it because you're looking for an office. Again, this is kind of that world of commercial, industrial, and Alamance County, but these are different markets. And so when I'm uh, making an analysis, I have to look at the sub-market that it's in, not the, the larger market generally, just the, the individual puzzle piece. If I break down the change at revaluation by some subgroupings, and each one of these is its own collection of sub-markets. Residential is not one market, it's just a grouping of other residential sub-markets. We see that from 22 to 23, Residential properties went up 81%. Industrial properties went up 76%. Farms went up 61%. Commercial went up 60%. Now, I've added in exempt and deferred so that we can get down to our taxable. Uh, the taxable's gone up 78. So when you hear me talk about the, the market and our valuation going up 78%, that's what we're talking about. But if you're a homeowner, you're in that 81% category. And if you have a farm, you're in that 61% category. But again, these are collections of sub-markets. So you've got residential properties up well more than 100%. You've got some that are up 60%. Right? There, there's a, a range of values. This is the average or the bottom line um, of each of these groupings. But you've got folks all over the place within these groups from high to low because there's all these little sub-markets inside of them. What's important? Quick question. Yes, you're, please. You're showing an increase 22 to 23. Are you saying that that is a that is an 81 percent increase in residential just in those years, or are you saying as it was valued in 2022 based upon 2018 value? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it mm -hmm. it's a, it's an 81 percent increase. That's right. Right. Something wrong with the residential. Number There's something wrong with the the slides. You're correct. I think I'm off a character there. Thank you, sir. Um, it is an 81% increase. I have to see what that is on the slide. I manually typed the slide. Uh, valuation prior mm -hmm. to valuation current. Yes. Yep. Um, and so if it comes up to, to 13, you can see that's not 3. That's probably Six. itself something. We'll see what it is. But my apologies. That is a typo on the slide. Um, the key thing is that if somebody's talking about... Um, the, the concern I hear is that residential went up, commercial didn't. Residential went up, farms didn't. Farms are up 61%, commercial's up 60%. And so I don't know how that's not an increase. Before the last few years of unusual market growth, if I said, hey, we're gonna increase commercial 60% in six years, I would've gotten some weird looks because it's such an extreme increase. And now today, well, they didn't go up at all. Well, they went up 60%. So the, the accurate statement is that residential went up more. It definitely went up more. The incorrect statement is when you begin to portray it as the entire increase is in residential, no one else is getting an increase. That's, that's a false statement. That's a misportrayal 
of what actually happened. But there's something I think a bit more telling than the real property side that I think we need to touch on. And that's what happens to other property types that we tax. For example, personal property is revalued every year. And in the last 10 years, it's been going up 6.1% per year. Additionally, public service companies are revalued every year. And over the last 10 years, they're up about 4% annually. Registered motor vehicles are revalued every year. They've been gaining 6.7% per year, 10-year average. And so unlike real property that is periodic, these other property types are revalued annually. If you look at what happened from 22 to 23 for them, here's that comparison. Real property is up 78%. Personal is up 6.1 and 4 and 6.7. So it looks pretty lopsided. Oh my goodness. All the burden is on real property. Nothing else is going up. And that's misleading, right? Because there's something else that's, that's at play here, I think, that we need to be aware of. And that's what happens over a life cycle. Because these other types are being revalued annually, but real property is periodic. The only way to make this apples to apples is to look over the whole span of that revaluation cycle and see what <coughs> happens over the lifetime. Now, to be able to be apples to apples, uh, in my model I'm about to show you, I'm factoring in 1.7% annual growth to real property. All right, this is from new construction, new houses, uh, new buildings that are built, development of land. We, we do see an increase in the value. Now, if, if we value your home at the beginning of a reval cycle and you do nothing to it, that value stays the same. We're not raising that. But if you build a new home, obviously we're not going to tax you for a vacant lot. We're going to tax you for the home that you built. So I'm going to factor in this growth to, to keep it apples to apples. If we say that in the last revaluation we achieved market value, so the goal was to get real property to 100% value, Personal is at 100% of its true value, public service motor vehicles, everything is at 100%. And we use the growth that we talked about, then one year in, right, we've got an extra 1.7% for real property, 6.1% for personal, et cetera, right? And you can see right there at the jump what's about to happen is that in this year, real property is the one that's not getting the increase. The others are getting a larger increase. What I want to show you here is that I've got the cumulative line. So in 2019, let's look at real property. If I had a 1.7% increase in 2018, and then I'm paying 3.4 in 2019 because it's gone up again, cumulatively, I'm over 5.1%, right? And if I run that again to 20, 21, 22, here's our state pre reval you can see it's pretty dramatic. So real property is 26% above the base assessment. Um, personal's at 99. Motor vehicles are at 109. This is lopsided, right? Mm -hmm. Then you bring that last year, we do a revaluation, here's this extra 78%. So now you're at 119 for real, but if we array these in order, you can see it came in third. Over the life cycle of the revaluation, it's not disproportionately getting an increase. It's somewhere in the pack and it's not at the top. So uh, I think we need to keep that in mind when we look at these changes. In the reval year, yet yeah, real property goes way up and the other property types don't go up much. But this is not unfair to real property owners when you consider the life cycle, that there, there's no um, imbalance there. Commissioner Carter, you look like you have a question. Well, I'm just puzzling a little bit. Sure. Uh, you have additions to furniture, fixtures, and equipment in, in industry. Mm -hmm. You have, but they depreciate. Mm -hmm. Motor vehicles depreciate. Mm -hmm. So, but you have people replacing cars, mm -hmm. trucks, and whatnot. Is, mm -hmm. is it a function of who's buying versus, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or additions to versus? Right. That's a good question. Exactly. Now, there are cases where you get appreciation. Uh, we, we have... Um, that happened in the used car market. That's exactly right. We, 21, 22. I will say sarcastically we are enjoying that at the moment because folks come in all the time. They say, why has my used car appreciated? Oh, yeah. Because it has. 
It simply has. So there are cases where the property appreciates, but typically we're seeing depreciation, but also a trading in over time. Every year, a certain percentage of vehicle owners buy a new vehicle, and that just turns year after year. And the, the situation is that on that individual car, let's say it's traditional depreciation year by year, that we're not having a, an unusual market like we are today. Um, do I care if my car appreciated or if I traded it in and brought a new car in and my bill went up? Do I care why my bill went up? Right? I don't. I care when I write that check what happened to my bill. So when we're looking at the base, if that, that property owner, this was their year to buy a new car, they get hit with that bill, they're not going to differentiate between a homeowner who might have gotten the same effect by appreciating property. The vehicle owner may have just turned the property, but when you write the check, it's the same check. So that, that's where it's, it's comparable. Now, um, kind of a, a quick analogy uh, that I'm going to call back to later, because I'm hearing this argument, and, and I want to make sure that we have a good understanding of how this works over that life cycle. It's the, the dinner analogy. So uh, four friends go out to dinner, and uh, this is a, an old favorite spot they haven't been to in a while, and they did not know how much prices have just gone up. <laughs> and so one of the dinner guests realized that, hey, I cannot pay for the meal. But we're all friends here. And so the other three say, look, no problem. We'll each chip in. We'll cover you. Don't worry about it. And that's what they do. And you know, what are friends for? And they like it so good that the next week they go back. And now that the person knows what he's about to pay, he's prepared to pay. They have the meal, everything is great, and here comes the check, and now it's time to pay. And suddenly his mood changes, and he says, this is unfair. You know what? Last time we were here, I paid $50, and now I'm paying $80. i am paying $30 more than last time, and each of you sitting around this table with me are paying $10 less. Now, how is it fair for me to pay $30 more and each of you to pay $10 less? But we know what the trick is, right? Over two meals, he's paid $130 in this example, and they've paid $170. What's not fair is they picked up his tab last week. That's what's not fair. And so there, there's a little perspective thing that happens, but it happens in what we're talking about. When it's revalue year, and here come the taxes, it's easy to say, well, this is unfair. Why is this other property type not going up as much as I am? But they were going up each year, and this is the rebalance year. Over the life cycle, it is perfectly fair, um, and, and that's something we, we just need to keep in mind. Uh, when I, I hear statements made that the revaluation is uh, balancing on the back of the homeowner, and that's just not true, right? Everyone is being put at an even level, the, the ask is that we tax at 100% of true market value, and that's what we're doing. Back to real property, because a lot of the comments have been commercial or farm. They're in the same boat as the, the dinner guests. So residential, when it's outpacing a farm, for example, the farm might be at 65% of its value. The residential might be at 55% of its value. We're basically subsidizing residential. The, the farmer is paying a higher percentage of their true value to the residential owner. And then we reset them back to 100. So this same dinner guest phenomena happens, not as extreme. Uh, so if you look at, so well, commercial didn't go up as much, farm didn't go up as much, that's because they were relatively paying more in prior years and were balancing everybody back out. Um, it may be good to look at, at where they stood just before reval. So this is the percentage of market value in the year before revaluation, 2022. And you can see that residential is just over 50% of true market value, right? And then it slowly climbs. Vehicles, personal property, public service are very close to 100% of market value. And I'm allowing the, the one-year interval to just before, so it's got a little bit of depreciation. But you can see there's an imbalance, and what revaluation does is it corrects the imbalance. So now we're all at 100%. Well, we don't have to go up much on three categories to get to 100%. They were almost there. They're revaluing every year. For real property, though, they had to move a much more substantial amount. But what's happened is we've gotten them to even. We're, we're, we're not doing anything unfair to real 
anything unfair to residential, we're just getting it even. Now we introduce a decrease in the tax rate. The tax rate was dropped significantly. A third of the tax rate came off. And that goes across the board. So what happens? Well, that little blue line that you're seeing is at 100%. This is the, the level playing field. The folks that were over last year are actually coming down in their bills to get back to, to level. And the folks that were under are coming up in their bills to get back to level. And so you get the dinner guest feeling. Your bill went down, my bill went up. But we're just trying to get back to level because just a couple of years ago, it was the other way around. And so we're just balancing out over the course of a life cycle. Um, any questions before I go into I know there's been some specific properties that have been brought up I want to talk about briefly. You mentioned at the outset that there are sub-markets within the, yes. the residential, mm -hmm. thinking about residential. Well, actually all of it. There's sub-markets mm -hmm. within real property. If you just look at residential, mm -hmm. what level of granularity did you look at for specific properties or specific neighborhoods to determine the, the schedule of values? Sure. So it, it varies. I mean, one of the first things that come to mind is the quality of the home. So if you've got an A quality home or a D quality home, those are different markets. A, a quality is one of our higher quality ratings. We actually have AAA, right? But it's a, it's a higher quality custom home, well, usually large, usually very nice neighborhood. D quality, they don't build Ds anymore. These are some more old mill housing, things like that, that probably wouldn't be at current standards, but they were 50 years ago, 80 years ago. Um, the person who's looking for a D grade home is not looking for an A. Right? The person who's looking for an A is not looking for a D. And so just by that, you're in different strata. Mm -hmm. um, more towards the middle, size can be an issue. But there is a correlation between size and quality. The typically higher quality homes are also larger, but not necessarily. Uh, location can be an issue, right? You have to look at, uh, we, we break the uh, county up into hundreds of neighborhood groupings. And so if you're comparing uh, a neighborhood that's in town versus one that's far out rural, those are different markets. Some people don't care. Some people do, and they specifically want to be one or the so other. So the analysis is neighborhood by neighborhood, and then, oh, and then specific property type mm -hmm. based upon perceived quality within neighborhoods. Sure. So it's pretty granular. Oh, yes, yeah. definitely. Okay. Definitely. Which gives you the variation mm -hmm. that, that put, when put together equals the 79%. Right. And, and then you do the same for commercial. You absolutely. You do the same for farm. You, I mean, right. So it's a pretty specific level of granularity, mm -hmm. which I think is important to note. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you have any idea why the house prices just shot up through the, like, to the moon? So many ideas why. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, it just, a realtor, that's a dream mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. But I mean, what happened to cause that? Because doing our reval was based on those high prices. Yeah. I mean, it can't stay that way. It's going to go don't down. I don't know. I don't There's know. It no has way. so far. Well. And, and the problem is we still have a supply and demand imbalance. Yeah. And it, it mm -hmm. seems uh, insane to me because I see how much building is taking place. Yeah. And it's not stopping the imbalance. Even with all that we're putting in for new housing, it's not curing it. Um, meaning, marketing, what? meaning what? Huh? Meaning what? Uh, meaning that the, the, the number of buyers looking for a home uh, are in excess of the number of sellers ready to sell a home. And you see this in the marketing times. Now, 20 years ago, I was a realtor. And you'd get somebody in a 90-day contract, and you'd hope to get a contract uh, by then because when you tried to renew them into another 90-day, they might jump to another realtor. And at, being a realtor, that was the exact moment they were ready to drop their price because they were tired of it. They'd drop their price, and they'd sell with the next person. You know, So that was the kind of marketing times that I'm used to from 20 years ago. Well, no. Um, a week? Two, sale, done. Why? Why are marketing times so short? Because you got a whole pack of buyers circling, waiting for somebody to open up. So that's an, a market imbalance. And as long as that market imbalance continues, and it continues, it's going to be hard outside of some really hard um, lender side issues or economy side issues that just take the buying power out. This is how you cure it. You get the interest rates so high that the buyers go away because they can't afford it. Or you, you crash the economy so hard that they don't have money. 
and they can't afford it. Until that happens, they're just circling, waiting for the next one to open up. And in that environment, we, we've continued to increase since we locked in. Uh, sales today are selling higher than their, their revaluation point. But you just heard the people, you just heard in crisis situations, mm -hmm. there, I mean, it's just, there is no housing for someone who can't sport sure. a half a million dollar house. I mean, it's just, I've never seen anything like it. It's just like, how do people afford this? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, we couldn't, I mean, we couldn't sell our house because I said, we should sell our house and we'll make all this money. And my husband goes, yeah, but we got to buy another house. Another it's going to be way up there. Yeah. So unless I'm going to a tiny home, I mean, it's just unbelievable. I don't know how people are doing this because everywhere I go, mm -hmm. there's some the big plot of land and they're building houses on it. And there are no such thing as a starter home anymore. No. Then I see this dude's face on this billboard in the middle where I go, I will buy your home. And I think, is he real? Because I'm yes, hearing he is. people are coming in here that are just like Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. They're eating mm -hmm. up these homes. They're flipping them. And it's, it's just like screwing a lot of people because they can't get their home. So, so the hardest hit are the most disadvantaged. One of the phenomena that we observed... Um, is, is a, a kind of a, a cascading, waterfalling sort of situation. Um, and just go with me about the grades of homes that there is a difference in quality of construction. If I'm looking for an A-grade home and there are none, I might buy a B-grade home. But what's interesting is I'll pay almost A-grade prices yeah. because I was about to spend that anyway. That crowds out the B-grade buyers and they will buy C-grade homes and pay almost B-grade prices. That crowds out the C's who buy D-grades, and that crowds out the D's. We have E-grade homes. You would not want to live in one. Um, pretty much when the D's get crowded out, they don't have housing, right? Because the C's are living in their houses because the B's are living in the C's houses, right? This is what we're noticing, and so this is one of the things that are raising you have a buyer that would not have traditionally bought that home, but there's no supply, so they will. Uh, and, and so when you look at growth, and you're, if you're in the A-grade market, if I see an A-grade home over the same length of time go up 55%, right? If I see a D-grade home go up 125%, yep, probably. Because the waterfall went all the way downhill. And that A-grade home buyer they may be able to handle an extra 55%. That D-grade home buyer, they, they can't pay double. Well, we're certainly seeing what the streets look like in big mm -hmm. cities, and we're not going to be above that either, which adds to our crime, which adds to everything. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there are people renting climate-controlled storage buildings mm -hmm. to live in. They're sharing it, expense. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think we all need to work and support ourselves. Right. But some of these things are such a reach, mm -hmm. you can't. Yep. So, you know, I mean, and it just goes through our whole community, we, and it ends up on our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I think of all the lunches at school. It mm -hmm. might be the only time some kids eat decent. Right. That's ridiculous. Right. It's, it's criminal to me that yeah. we... I just see where we're building all this stuff, and I'm thinking, man, our, the county's bank account should just be, like, just big. But we're charging big. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. And I'm, I'm just plain and simple me. I, I think it's just wrong. Yeah. But that don't matter what I think. I just, I don't know. I understand. Well, we're the, I believe the last, the last number I heard, we're still, are we still the 10th fastest growing county in the state? Oh, I do not know that. that. Was the last number. I would believe it. I don't, I don't no, know. Not off the top of my head. I don't know. We were right there, one of the top. Mm -hmm. The fastest growing counties in the state. And I mean, we just lowered our tax rate. Mm -hmm. So think about what the impact that that's going to have on people sure. looking about where to do it with the development. So we lowered our tax rates. So I wouldn't be, I wouldn't pay like a $9 million tax rate on my little house. That, I understand that lowering that tax rate. It could have been, golly, but we're the number one state in the country, right, for attracting new businesses. Mm -hmm. But why are we so low on the school performance? It, it doesn't add up because you want solid schools to feed your businesses because of getting kids prepared for Job Corps. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not 
y'all are so far ahead of me. I can't speak. You're so far ahead of me on stuff like this, but the word that comes to me is it's just unfair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and as a just a common person, right. I'm thinking, we say, well, we lowered your tax rate, but I got my tax bill, right. and I got my city of Burlington mm -hmm. tax bill. Mm -hmm. oh, Kaboom. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I'm thinking, God. Why don't? Why are we having people that not? Never mind. I'm just gonna shut up because it's just <laughs> ticking me off. Uh -huh. But you know, I, I it's just I don't get it because I'm not. I'm not y'all, but I just, huh? I just know the hardship on people, and back to school and mm -hmm. every church in the county's giving free book bags. Uh -huh. Does anybody buy their own school supplies anymore? That's what it almost looks like. The perception mm -hmm. of that. Uh -huh. I think why we're all struggling so much, but yet. Sometimes we go because we can get it free, mm -hmm. not because we have to. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff mixed up in this. Mm -hmm. um, uh. oh. Mold, that's another one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always been mold. I could get off on mold real easy from being on that school board. But um, I don't know. It's just, and I'm just glad you're here talking about this because mm -hmm. I've heard how these big businesses just got so many breaks and the farmers got so many breaks, which if they don't work, we don't eat, so give them a break. But, you know, I just want it to be fair for everybody. I don't want mm -hmm. it on the backs of one certain part mm -hmm. of our whole community because mm -hmm. that in itself is not fair. Mm -hmm. But if that business isn't open, there's not employees, and they don't produce a product, and I can't get by it. Because if Food Line don't operate, it's not good because they don't make milk in the back of Food Lines with no. our one dairy farm. Right. I mean, I don't know. It's just, it just adds up. And mm -hmm. Are we going to be looking at this again for another, I'm going to say that word, reval. It's like Fonzie saying wrong. Remember that episode? <laughs> I do. But I mean, is it going to, are we going to get stuck like this again? I mean, we can't do that. Well, and that's the question is what will the market do during that time period? Um, if the market is flat, then you can expect a flat reval. If it's recessionary, you can expect values to go down. <clears throat> if it continues to climb the way that it has the last couple of years, then you probably see a replay. What revaluation is all about is capturing the snapshot of the market at that point and, and rebalancing to, to that, what, what is 100% at that point. Um, and, and it is a situation where over those multiple prior years, there has been an imbalance and we're trying to fix it. Um, it it's just it's uh, unknown, you know, what, what's going to happen in the next year. But our focus is let's get to market, let's see what the value is. Um, and, and proceed from that point. Well, it's really, it's scary because, I mean, it's, it's just a scary time. I, you know, like, where's the middle class going? Because that's me. I'm not even middle middle. I mean, you know, I'm, and I, you know, we talk about our homeless, but you add addiction in there, and that's why. Mm -hmm. you, you choose it because you've gotten down that low, and that's just your normal, which is not normal. And now we got so much just, um, I just look at mankind, I think we're becoming the flipping walking dead. Mm. That's what it looks like, you. you know, and I don't want that here. Mm. I don't want that. I want everybody to have a home, whatever their home looks like and they can afford. But mm -hmm. that's the key to our whole world is your family and your home. Mm -hmm. It starts there because we see what bad homes bring to schools. Mm -hmm. It's all affected. Right. It's all in the same bucket. I don't mm -hmm. care what we say. It is. Yeah. <sighs> Any other comments? Uh, I was just going to make a comment to what you said, Jeremy, about <clears throat> uh, the values have not went down. Mm -hmm. There's no line in sight that they're going to come down. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you why. Mm -hmm. Everybody who has worked in the banking industry can understand this. Mm -hmm. When interest rates go up, it keeps people from buying new homes, mm -hmm. like Ms. Thompson was saying. Mm -hmm. You can't sell your home because you have to go out and replace it right. with a higher value. Mm -hmm. And if you have to borrow some money... Now the interest rates are three times higher than they were right. three years. Exactly. That is what's going to, and that's what's going to have to happen. Interest mm -hmm. rates are going to have to go up. Mm -hmm. And the bad thing about this is there's another part of that equation that has to happen too, and that's the, you're going to have to start seeing people get fired. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to start seeing labor start to, like, you're going to increase. That's the only way mm -hmm. that you're going to get to lower prices in, in your home. That's it. And unless those two things happen, prices are still going to be high. Mm -hmm. And what concerns me is they could stay here for a while mm -hmm. because with the elevated inflation rate, mm -hmm. 
that is not that mm-hmm. doesn't go away in a day. It doesn't go right. away in a month. Doesn't go away right. in a year. This could be. And this is what's going to cause our evaluation that we did. It's when you look at it, mm-hmm. it affected me too. Mm-hmm. Um, you go, wow, how did that happen? And then that presentation that you showed. Mm-hmm. Gives everyone a little bit of a sense of how this occurred. It didn't happen overnight, mm-hmm. but it was a slow process. Mm-hmm. And like most things, when they get into the momentum phase, mm-hmm. they really, really mm-hmm. accelerate. Yeah. And that momentum phase is not a particular time on that. Mm-hmm. That momentum phase could could actually stay with us for several years. That's what I'm saying. Whoever your county commissioners are in the next four year reevaluation needs to take a look at this mm-hmm. reevaluation mm-hmm. before they make any decisions on the next one mm-hmm. because you're going to see things it's mm-hmm. going to get your 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 time frame is not only it's it's, it's out further mm-hmm. but you're actually going to see an increase in things that you never thought would stay oh, sure. up that that long everyone's patting themselves on the back mm-hmm. in our in our government <clears throat> about inflation mm-hmm. and they always point to eggs i wish our notorious <laughs> egg farmer was here today so we could talk to him about that I remember back that people called me, and I just went and bought a dozen eggs at the store. It cost me $4 and a half. Mm-hmm. Would you buy the organics? No, they were $6 and a half. Right, right. And then those prices come back to somewhat normal levels. They're not four and a half bucks. Now they're, mm-hmm. now they're two and a half dollars. Mm-hmm. Everyone seems to think that that is, okay, that's the, that's mm-hmm. the checkered flag. We're mm-hmm. done with inflation. Oh, mm-hmm. no. No. It comes down. It retests. It goes back higher. So in the next four years, I would be surprised Mm -hmm. if our values go down. I agree. I would be surprised if they went down. Now, they Mm -hmm. may slightly be a little Mm -hmm. bit lower than, I don't see it. Mm -hmm. Just because when you're looking out at how these things work, they Mm -hmm. don't correct themselves in six months to Mm -hmm. 12 months. You may have a reduction in real terms if you control for inflation. But with raw dollars, I don't see it. Well, I know that the Federal Reserve mm-hmm. uses uh, producers' consumption mm-hmm. expenditures, mm-hmm. not the PCI that everybody in the news media likes to focus on. Mm-hmm. Why would you focus on an index when you can focus on the expenditures that the person needs right. and where they're spending their money? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look in our economy, things aren't getting soft in any way. Right. And it's just rolling over to, to, uh, to, to your your property values. Mm-hmm. That's just what it is. I thank you so much for coming in today mm-hmm. for, for this presentation because I think people really need to uh, mm-hmm. to see it mm-hmm. and, and to see how things work in real terms rather mm-hmm. than things that you yeah. think may occur. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a, it was a great presentation for oh, everybody in the you. county to understand mm-hmm. this process that we went through because mm-hmm. I know that you and I have been talking about this for well over a year sure. mm-hmm. uh, and how difficult it was going to be to get this right. Mm-hmm. Uh, because like in your presentation, mm-hmm. You are going to capture the market value. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. what you're. That's what, just taking. That's the goal. Just taking a picture and mm-hmm. walking away. Just like when you take pictures now and look at them in ten years. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, look how young I look. <laughs> 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 that's a point. say. It's a very simple <laughs> thing that's going to happen. Well, and um, if mm-hmm. we're ready, I'd like to share one last piece, and I'll get out of your way. Thank you. Uh, which is, I know there have been some specific concerns raised, and just like to address those. Um, the the poster child is Lowe's Home Improvement. This is the one I've, I've been hearing about the most. And this is due to the very small amount of increase from 2022 to 2023. That's what's triggered off the concern. Now, it's composed of two parcels. Uh, you have one parcel valued at $6.9 million. That is the store itself. But there's a second parcel valued at one6 that is the parking lot. So if we look at it as a combined property, we're valuing at $8.5 million. And it's got 131,000 square feet, so we've got it at $65, actually $65.26 a square foot. So that's the valuation we currently have on Lowe's. Now, the change from 22 to 23, uh, it went from 8 million to 8.5. It's gone up about 6%. That's a very small increase. And then when the tax rates come in with a reduction, the bill itself is down about 12%. And this is what's triggering off the concern, right? Um, how, how can Lowe's go down on their bill 12%, right? That doesn't make sense. And the argument that I hear is that they're making money hand over fist. 
during the, the COVID years and the, and the home improvement boom, and surely this can't be right. Um, and I would agree that they, they definitely had a, a boom time in the market, um, but that's, that's over at this point. Um, this is what CNN said. America's home improvement boom appears to be over. CNBC, Lowe's downgraded Evercore ISI, site slowing home improvement demand. Barron's uh, says Lowe's gets another downgrade. This analyst sees muted margin gains ahead. Uh, we're, we're just, we're on the back side of that, that boom. And when you look at the, the property, you're, you're looking at what is its future production ability. If it's on the, the, the downside, that, that's not good. Um, we do still have a building boom. I mean, we're, we're constantly building, but you get a lot of uh, national and regional builders that have their own supply chains. They're not shopping at Lowe's to build the house. They, they've got that taken care of. In fact, uh, residentially, I'm, I'm more familiar. Uh, a lot of times they own everything from the forest forward. Sorry. And uh, because they control the supply chain, they're keeping their costs way down. But again, they're not shopping at Lowe's. Um, the local builders are going to shop at Lowe's, um, but that's just not enough to, to stem this tide. So we have to differentiate between uh, the cost to construct and the market value because I'm called to, to report market value. Um, if we're talking about the cost of construction, no, 6% increase, not remotely correct. Um, that, that does not capture what's happening with material costs and labor costs. But we're not talking about building a new Lowe's. We're talking about selling a 26-year-old Lowe's, and these are just different questions. Um, if I wanted to know how much it would cost to replace it, then the best evidence would come from construction costs, which is considerably more than this. Um, this is actually the basis, like if you get an insurance value to a property. Uh, this is pulled from buyer's right, their commercial insurance folks. Uh, and I, I just noted, uh, they say insurance companies don't care about market value. Uh, replacement cost has nothing to do with the market value of the property. They're, they're looking at the property for very different reasons, but I'm called to report the market value of the property, and the best way to get to that are actual sales. Let's see what the market is doing. And so when you're talking about Lowe's, this is problematic. Uh, Lowe's is notorious uh, for only selling properties when they're in severe decline. So you have a much older structure, it needs physical work. It's got functional limitations based on how old it is. A lot of times it was in an up and coming area when it was built and it's now in an area that's in decline. And what they'll do is they'll build the new, much larger, more modern center in the new desirable spot and they'll abandon the old center. And when they sell it, uh, besides these other problems, they'll sell it with restrictions so that no one can compete against them. They can't buy that, that uh, property and use it to compete back against Lowe's. Well, when you sell under those conditions, you do not get optimal buyers. Um, it's not a Lowe's sale, but it's just one that I go to, the old Kmart location that became Granddaddy's Antiques. Now, I love Granddaddy's Antiques. That is a neat place to go walk around, right? But that's not the same sort of tenant as a Kmart. But those are the sorts of tenants that move into old Lowe's buildings. Right. And so to find really good comparable sales to a Lowe's location that is still good shape, still operating, not at the end of its life cycle. Uh, I know that, that we've uh, moved further down towards University Drive, but we still have tons of activity where Lowe's is at. You know, where, where do you find comps for this? And we were very fortunate to find two. I'd love to have more than two comps, but we're, we feel lucky to have two comps. Uh, the comps that we have, and let's look at the subject. Uh, at 125 Huffman Mill Road, it's got 131,000 square foot, built in 1997. As of January 1st of this year, we valued it at 8.5 million, which is $65.26 a square foot. We do have a comparable Lowe's sale in Reedsville, that's Rockingham County, 144,000 square feet, built in 2001. So a little bit bigger, a little bit newer. And that is a trend. They tend to uh, increase in size as they build newer units. It sold in April of 21 for $7.5 million. That's $52.37 a square foot. Obviously, we don't want to go down to $52 a square foot. But we do have another sale. This is in Waxhaw, North Carolina, Union County, 149,000 uh, square feet, 
built in 2008, again, a little bit bigger, a little bit newer, sold in August of 22, so very near our assessment date, for $9.7 million. That's $65.51 a square foot. And I would note that we are in line with the higher of the two sales. Uh, like I said, we feel uh, fortunate to have two, and we're in line with the higher of the two sales. Now, when you only have two, that makes me nervous. You know, is there anything we can do to reality check the situation? And so we did a reality check on it. Uh, we pulled 111 Lowe's values from other county assessors to see what they're, they're being assessed for generally. Because on appeal, they will bring out, because they've appealed here before, they'll bring out all the other assessments across the state, and they'll say, here's what your peers assess us for, and they'll use that as evidence in their appeal. So let's go ahead and do that for them. Let's see what they're, what they're at. We found uh, properties built in 1969 up to 2021, from 79,000 square foot to 193,000 square foot. Uh, the median was $67 a square foot. Now, when we pared it down to better matches, we pared down to 28 locations. These are within five years of the subjects, so 92 to 02, and 5% of the square footage. So from 123,000 to 137,000, so these are much better matches. We still got a median of $66 a square foot. So the reality check says, hey, when we lined up with that sale, that lines up with the assessments. Um, we think that $65 a square foot is a defensible number. It's a reasonable number. And if we go much above that, we, we could speculatively run the value up, and they will appeal because they are, are fans of an appeal. They've, they've carried it. I know past the, the state up to the Court of Appeals, I believe they went to the Supreme Court. Uh, yeah, they, they like an appeal. Not on us. They like an appeal. And if we ran it up, they'd appeal it right back down to 65. But, but why do that to people? Why, why raise them speculatively? Why not use the market data we have, put them in a reasonable range? So I know there's complaint about the Lowe's value, but I, I think it's an appropriate value. Um, the other thing that was brought up was Holly Hill Mall, and uh, that's confusing to me. Uh, the argument here is that the only increase that Holly Hill Mall had was that, that they put in a Publix, and that's the only increase that they had. Um, the Publix is on a separate parcel. I mean, any just cursory review of the data would show that this is not true, so I, I don't know why this gets brought up. Um, the Holly Hill Mall parcel is beside the Publix, and they went up 147%. Right? They're two and a half times what they were before. They went from 6.2 million to 15.4 million. I don't know how this is indicative that they don't, we don't increase commercial. In fact, I, I would say that this is a poster child for an increasing commercial value. So, to, to answer the Holly Hill Mall concern, I, I don't see the concern. Um, I do want to briefly talk about anecdotes and averages, uh, and then I'll, I'll leave you alone. It's been a long morning. Um, we, we've got one appraiser per 10,000 parcels. Um, I am certain that if you look far enough around, you're going to find something wrong, badly wrong and embarrassing. I am sure if, if it's not been found yet, it is luck, it is out there. Um, it, that's just the, the name of it. Huh? <laughs> right? I found one yesterday that popped up. And, and, and so that's the thing. The, the two that have been, uh, complaints have been raised about, Thankfully, we're good on. I feel good about the values. I think that they're reasonable. But keep looking. There is something out there that, that is in this state, I'm sure. That's just the nature of revaluations. No matter what you do, when you're talking about uh, you know, 76,000 parcels, you're going to have a certain percentage that, that oops. Um, that being said, we, we like to hear about them because we like to fix them. You know, when we're made aware of a problem, we address that problem. Um, at the same time, if you look at the revaluation on average across the board, I think it's good. I'm very proud of it. I'm very confident in it. Uh, that outliers aside, um, I think that on average we have good values. They're representative market values. Our opinions are just our opinions, but they're at least well-supported opinions. Uh, and I feel confident in that. I don't think there's any property type that is carrying the load, any property type that's getting off easy. Uh, we did our very best to get everyone to market value, which is what we're charged to do. Um, do you have any questions? Mr. Turner? 
Thank you, Chair. Absolutely. Ms. Thompson? Uh-uh. I just, I, I just, I appreciate I asked you to do this, and I'm, I'm glad you did because um, the perception of some things can just be what they are. Um, the appearance of things can be that, and then it's just like changing carpet in a church. It's really tough. And I'm a citizen, and it's tough. It really is. Um, but I, I just hope we don't are looking at this again the next time we evaluate. This has been extremely difficult, and I mean, I've heard about the appeals with the, the committee, mm -hmm. and um, I had one, and granted, mm -hmm. and I didn't do mine. I thought, I can't, mm -hmm. that's be such a hypocrite to come in here and ask for a decrease on my tax bill when I'm one of the five. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. Mm -hmm. huh, but it's been hard. It's been hard on this county, and I know there are seniors that it's, it's going to be a struggle for them, mm -hmm. and that's, you don't live your whole life. Mm -hmm to get to a point to where then you can't afford your home. Right. I just don't think that's that's right. not America. Right. right now, America's hot mess, right. I'll just say it. And, um, and it just is. And like Bill was talking about the inflation rate, I remember what it was the last election, and now look at it, it was almost, what, at nine, Bill, eight, eight or nine? And we think that three or four is, God, it's like thinking gas at 350. Mm -hmm. Man, that's so much better than five. Mm -hmm. It's still not better, not for this country, but it's all in the decisions and leadership. That's where it all starts. So, but I, I, I know that I guarantee your picture is on a lot of people's refrigerator. <laughs> it looks just like that with mine too. <laughs> so uh, I just, um, I'm just thankful for this county. I'm thankful people want to come here and build, but I just always want us to have balance because I never want it to be on the backs. I, I fuss about it being, you know, stuff is on the backs of children. It's nothing supposed to be on their backs. They're supposed to have just a bright path ahead of them. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's, it's taxes are just, it's, it's like stomping mud. And they take the straw, and then what are you supposed to do? And it's, you know, I'm a taxpayer too. And, God, I know how my groceries go up. I think it's the same flipping cow in the same pasture. He thinks he's better the next week. And chickens, wait till it snows. People ain't going to be buying bread, milk, and eggs. They're going to be something else because they won't be able to do the eggs. I mean, think about stuff like that. That's very silly, but it's very true. When you think about doing without eggs, I'm a baker. Good mm -hmm. Lord at the mm -hmm. eggs I go through. I need to have my own chickens. Mm -hmm. But... I don't know who that chicken's got an attitude. You know, they walk around going, don't hate me because I'm rich. I mean, it's just crazy. It's crazy. Mr. Blashley? I just want to thank you, Jeremy, for taking the time to come in here and talk about this today. I think it was definitely needed. Um, I'm glad you uh, looked at some of the things that uh, you'd heard in this in this room mm -hmm. yeah. with certain people's and, and, and just make sure that we we take things uh we appreciate people coming in and, and give us their ideas and stuff but i really like the fact that you took the time to go out and say hey, this is this is the truth this is this is where we landed and this is why mm -hmm. it's very good thank you keep up the good work thank you mr paisley I just want to say thank you as well thank you thank you sir and uh let me add my thanks as well uh, you know, one of the things you pointed out, and uh, while we were going through the process of trying to set the tax rate, um, we took a look at the, at the uh, personal property to uh, residential, and the uh, residential property owner, and uh, as your uh, kind of a, what I might call swag. <laughs> Um, I, won't, I won't say what those four letters stand for, but anyway. Um, Sophisticated wild ass guess. Yes, you know, somebody else did. But uh, you didn't. the average at a, at a median priced home and a median priced car for the state, for the county, the average homeowner is going to see about a $5 increase in their property tax per month, or $10 increase in their property tax per month, but see a $5 decrease in their car tax. Yeah. per month so um, and then that all depends on whether or not they bought a new car kept mm -hmm. the car they had whatever mm -hmm. all the different things that can impact it but I mean we've everybody at this on this board has struggled through this whole process this has been probably a, I, nobody was here 
nobody on this board was here in the last valuation. So we hadn't gone through it before, and this one was a whole lot different from the last one. And we've set a four-year cycle, which hopefully will mitigate taking it out as far. But I've said this before, I try to follow real estate values. I think others of us on here do too. And I have just had a neighborhood house go on the market, and it was already sold before the sign went in the front yard. I went up with, yes. a, with a sale pending. Um, I have another neighbor's house on the market um, that's been out there a while now. And uh, comparatively, very nice home, but comparatively, they're, they're probably high end of the market value asking price. So that may be an indicator. The ones I see dropping look like that. I, when I look at them, I think they, they probably overpriced at the listing time. Mm -hmm. And it's adjusting itself. People aren't stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, we aren't out there now, I think, with people coming in with twice the asking price in their pocket and uh, ready to pay more than they have to. But uh, we went through that, and that's part of what drove us drove to where we are right now. Um, but I really appreciate what you brought to us. And it shows, I think it does, hopefully, to our citizens, it shows that we're paying attention to the comments and the questions that are coming before us when we ask you to bring this kind of information and put the kind of time and effort into bringing a report like this to us. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. Okay. County attorney report. No official business. That's what thank I you. Thought. But on a personal <laughs> note, I would like to thank the board for the uh, pleasure to serve you. Uh, today is my last day with the firm, yeah. so this will be my last <laughs> meeting, but I've enjoyed sitting with y'all and being here for the past two years, and thank you for all the memories. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Congratulations. Well, Patrick, we hate that. <laughs> County Manager's Report. I personally didn't have anything, but Vice Chairman Carter, you had asked for Bruce to give an update on the great grant. Did you want to hear that sure. now? Or? I was going to I was going to bring that up in a moment myself, but sure, go okay, ahead. I think he's ready to share a little information on that based on what you had requested. So real quick, you know, in the last few months, we've got awarded. Uh, we initially got awarded uh, the Lumos uh, great grant project, which was. Uh, if you see in dark purple um, where they got the actual money to expand um, and if you think about it of course these are all landlines and so the very specific areas where they were allowed to go to those are, are demonstrated from the state because of a state survey and I'll show you that in a minute but of course they got to get there and so they got to put the lines in to get there and of course they're planning to compete along those corridors as well so the southern part of the county has been a really big issue for a long time. They took advantage of the great grant. This board approved using ARP funds fifty thousand uh, dollars for almost a six million dollar project to leverage the great grant funding to the state and federal government. So they had a presentation in Burlington and one in Mebbin about this. This was their map, um, so I stole it, took a picture of it. Uh, so we have that for them, and then recently. People were saying, well, heck, you know, how do we let people know what's going on? So if you see the green areas, that's the areas, and it's kind of hard to see, but this is the state map, not my map. Right here above Mabin and that area that I just showed you, southern part of the county, that was the Lumos project. AT&T got the second round of grants, which is right in this area. If you see that they're ad uh, these are points. These are all related to the map. The state did something very responsible. They said, hey, we're if we have one place, we did a survey a few years ago with our taxpayers, with the tax bill to see, hey, we need to know where you have it, where you don't. The state said, we'll take on that role because you have to prove it to the federal and state government. The state has a survey, which we've been advertising the last two or three years. We bring it up from time to time. We use the school right. kids and stuff like that. Um, <coughs> So these are directly, as you put these points in, you can see them at the state survey map, you can see it. <clears throat> so when people call me and say, what can I do, what can I do? I've got a petition or whatever like that. They say, hey, I'll send you the link. It's on our web page. It's on, uh, uh, on the big screenshot. It's on our uh, internet access page. We have a lot of information to help people. 
get internet access. I get calls weekly about it. But if you fill out the survey, and of course it's funny, it's an online survey, they also have, you can do it through text and you can do it through a phone call and it, it will record your address and let the state know this is where we need help. And so that was the request from Mr. Carter to talk about that. You've seen this before, it's hung up. We have it in the libraries, we've sent it to the schools. Again, it talks about doing the online survey, where to call, you can do it through the text, that kind of thing. This is the best way, the best path forward to get you and your neighbors to do that. Now, nobody wants to fill out a survey, a government survey, my God, I understand that, but this is the one time where if you want to get in the door and get access to these grants, and there's a lot of grants coming down the pike, um, this is the way to do it. So you asked me to put that out there. Again, I'm going to hand a copy to the, our media as well. We put it on social media. Uh, please, please, please fill out the survey. This is, how you, this is a direct result. Many other states don't have this. We do. Whether it was blind luck or, you know, intuition, they did it right. So get on that survey, and that's going to help you get, help us tell them where people need right. help. So that's the quick version. Any questions? Any questions? I just want to say that you've actually helped me out quite a bit because I've been working with a group of folks that are right. I mean, they can see the Chatham County. Oh, I know. And I went out there and uh, had some folks that were like neighborhood, you know, like from the church, Southward churches across uh, around the corner. And you hit the nail on the head. They were extremely apprehensive to fill out any government servant. Totally get it. And I told them it has nothing to do with the government. It has everything to do with you. If they don't know you have a problem until you let them know you have a problem. So yep. it, got, uh, it, was a, it was a community effort. Everybody out there signed up this survey and I certainly hope that the state's paying attention because when I initially started this I thought maybe it was just like maybe people in a, in a, in a dark spot and people around the corner have it. No. That whole community from like maybe two or three miles north of the Alamance Chatham line, those folks are in the dark. They have to have a landline or they don't communicate with anyone. Right. There's no internet service right. to speak of. I know there are a few who have it, and there's one group that uh, some of the kids come to the other neighbor's house because they have internet service. Yeah. And uh, it really needs to be fixed. And I'm really, ho I'm really hoping that people will see what you're suggesting for them to do because it does help and it does work. We really saw that during COVID with kids having to do online services. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, kids being at the McDonald's parking lot or Starbucks mm -hmm. parking It was just, but you don't really think about it until it's all you have. And when you don't have it, I'm talking about terror and fear for kids. It's, it's hot spots, that's so expensive. This is a blessing, it really is. I did tell the folks out there, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> because uh, I got a niece and nephew who think the world's going to come to an end if they can't access the internet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, again, we we jumped from two competitors to now four or five. That'd be great. And that helps. Yes. And again, Station's when they compete, good. that means you know there's. Mm -hmm. And again, I take any call. There's there's some ways around mm -hmm. some things, but that survey is the number one way to access and leverage. And these private companies, they have these plans <coughs> in the works. This just helps grease the grease the wheel and get them going mm -hmm. and, and finish that final mile that needs to happen. There's, I heard some uh, comments from the people out there that uh, Randolph actually had brought from Chatham North, but they stopped at the line. Yep. Because they, they took me down and showed me a, a, a man's house who walk in, he's got streaming services, he's got everything that everyone has in the city, but just people, you know, two miles up the road, nothing like that. Yeah. Don't have access. Randolph actually applied for a great grant um, before the pandemic and did not get receive it. That was when it was only $15 million for the whole state, and now it was over $400 million. So we hope they apply again. Yeah. You know, we'd love to have Randolph in the, the county as well. So uh, more and merrier. I'm sure the nice Toyota plant helped a lot. Yeah, that should that. help yeah. too. <laughs> Absolutely. Can you imagine Toyota not having any? Yeah, <laughs> sit in their cars and do what I want. Commissioners, <laughs> comments? Comments? Comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair. Three quick things. Um, one impact elements, one about elements County DSS, and one about Burlington Elements Regional Airport. Um, a thanks to impact elements for, we covered in the, in the consent agenda, a $100,000 grant for walking tracks. 
at Bieber Jordan and uh, AO schools. Those are both locations where we're committed to uh, improving the ball fields there for um, uh, for Alamance County athletics uh, in different parts of the county. So uh, thanks to them for helping out with that with some walking tracks. Um, DSS, this month is Child Support Awareness Month for uh, the state of North Carolina. Uh, in support of that and in recognition of that, DSS is doing a couple things that I thought it would be good for people to know about. The first is um, ch a Child Support 101 class for those who, who believe that, uh, you know, that they need to get some help with child support and don't know, how to, don't know where to go. August 15th, Graham Library, both uh, in the morning and in the afternoon, there's, there's two hours of classes there. Uh, it's so important for kids to have both parents involved in their lives, both for social support, psychological support, and certainly financial support. So this helps with that, with the last piece of that. Uh, also on the 21st at the Graham Public Library, so, um, sort of the other side of that, for non-custodial parents to get information about how to be involved with their kids and the expectations, also, um, also the other side of that. And then finally, October, August 17th at the Human Services Building parking lot, um, August 17th uh, morning and afternoon. There's a community day for information about how to get child support services and some back to school supplies as well. So Child Support Awareness Month, it's big in the county. And the, the last thing is the Burlington Elements Airport. You may um, notice that there are fewer airplanes flying around uh, Burlington this month. The airport is closed for 30 days while uh, we do some, while we, while they do some uh, runway repair. The runways haven't been repaired since 2004. So the airport is closed to allow a complete resurfacing of the runway and also doubling of the size of the apron, which is the parking space that's right in front of the Air Operations Center, allows more aircraft to just get refueled and have services there. So a big improvement there, $10.9 million improvement, 90% of that's covered by uh, the FAA, the federal government, and a 10% match with local funds. Uh, so that's a big deal. We've got to do it, and it's finally time to get that done. And then that will also help with the... Um, the, uh, the new construction for a new corporate hangar there. Once that's complete in June of 2024, it'll be uh, an increase in the uh, in the tax base to the county of $70 million, both in terms of the, the hardware and uh, the airplanes that come. So a lot happening at the airport. That's a good thing and it's setting us up for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Thompson? Nothing. Mr. Lashley? No, I have nothing. Thank you. Mr. Paisley? Oh, yes, sir. Just want to thank uh, particularly the county, the county staff. Uh, everyone is, during my injury, uh, kept me pretty much fully aware, and they're sending documents out to my house for signatures, all kinds of things of that sort. But also you county commissioners. Uh, everybody's been very helpful. Uh, everyone's called me, uh, and just the community uh, at large, received a number of calls and uh, cards and things of that sort, and your prayers have been appreciated. Just want to say thanks. Well, we miss you. We'll oh, get you back way, in the should, and, and should be at our next meeting without any difficulty. Things are getting much, much better daily. Good. I think, I hope our citizens have heard today, I, I feel like this board feels that all of us feel like we work for you. Um, but when we get questions, I mean, the comments that, uh, that I've heard uh, Bill talking about visiting down in the southern part of the county near Chatham County, um, we all do that sort of thing. I mean, we get a call, I get calls, of, I don't know how, I, I'm on several different transportation committees and boards, so maybe that's the reason I get the calls about issues with DOT, but I, I've been able to help a number of our citizens with that. Um, we get calls about all sorts of other issues where we can point a citizen or connect a citizen to somebody who can provide a service and meet a need, and that's, that's our job, to, to try and help our citizens take care of what their needs are, whatever those might be, and uh, I think we all take it seriously I think personally I know I love it it's a lot of fun um, it can be tedious and time consuming sometimes but that's what we signed on for so thank you so much for bringing the questions and issues and needs to us keep on doing that 
and uh, we'll keep on trying to serve our citizens. Um, anything else today? If not, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Oh, <laughs> Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.tv tvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the county commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.